Commissioner Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Montesino. Oh, I'm sorry, I see Commissioner Alternate Hurst. Right here. Commissioner Caput. Commissioner Alternate Hernandez. Commissioner uh, Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Alternate Quinn. Here. Commissioner Parker. Here. And Commissioner Rodkin. You have a quorum. But we will now move on to oral. Oral communications is a time for members of the public on items uh, on today's agenda. I can't hear. Yeah, my microphone is off. There's a little green button in there. And it says on Zoom that we're still in a practice session. I don't know because we're hybrid if this is supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> I'll use this time to say that this is our first uh, hybrid meeting. And so we are uh, working on uh, logisticating and making sure the meeting runs smoothly. And so we'll do our best to keep things moving along. Um, but we may, we probably will learn some things along the way. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you Yesenia's mic is muted now, so if you're still speaking, um, Chair Brown, we can't hear you. Okay, and I don't know that I can can I do anything about that? No, Thank you. Now. Okay, so now uh, members out in the virtual audience can now hear me as well as members in the chambers. Great. Okay, um, so uh, speakers, uh, you may come up and you're, I'll ask that you just state your name clearly so it can be recorded accurately for the minutes. And we are using a system that is not totally within our control at the moment. So we are gonna be doing two minutes um, for, for all our communications, thanks. Thank you. My name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos and uh, I'm just delighted to be back in, in person. And I thank the commission for, for permitting hybrid meetings to continue too, because we can't all, all of us always get down here. Uh, it's great to see you all. I just wanted to speak to uh, real briefly uh, the, 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 the defeat of measure D and the, uh, the implications of that. Uh, and having to do with the trail, which I don't think is on the agenda anywhere. Um, during the last open house that I attended at Live Oak Elementary, I, uh, several of us actually were asking about alternatives through Capitola, uh, only to be told that Measure L prevents a lot of what might be better alternatives than the trail next to the tracks. For example, along Park Avenue, wouldn't it be wonderful to at least study widening Park Avenue to include a buffered bikeway, a safe separate at grade connecting to all the side streets, bikeway instead of forcing it down with the tracks. But Measure D, Measure L, Capitola Measure L, re prevents that from being studied or considered. And with a 70, almost 75% defeat of the Greenway Measure D, one wonders if we might not be able to uh, launch an effort to undo Capitola Measure L. How how sad that that Capitola voted itself into a position which actually removes options, and they may suffer from having a much better trail because of that measure. So I hope I hope the community will think about ways to undo Measure L. Thanks. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. So great to be here. Uh, good morning, RTC staff and commissioners. My name is Lonnie Faulkner, and I'm the director of Equity Transit, and I live in District 1. As this is the first regular RTC meeting uh, after the June 7th election, I want to reflect that Greenway's Measure D definitively lost the election. Despite confusing and misleading messages, our community became actively involved in understanding this ballot measure, and our vote was decisive. The majority of people in our community do not want to eliminate rail from the general plan. We do not want to rip out our tracks. We do not want a trail only, and we do not want adverse abandonment against Roaring Camp. What our county's clear opposition to Greenway 
noise measure D does mean is that we absolutely do want clean light rail as soon as possible. Easily accessible, dependable, frequent public transit service is our way forward into the future we need right now. It is what we've needed for decades. Climate change is upon us and we need to get people out of their cars. The taxes we all pay to build roads and highways do not benefit all people in our communities equally, as many people cannot afford the high cost of driving a car. A lack of robust public transit in this country is the number one barrier to better education, better jobs, voting, and overall access to opportunity. Light rail for our community will address unmet needs and equity in the environment and connect us to the California Rail Network, California State Rail Network. We appreciate the efforts of the RTC staff and commissioners to move forward in support of the mandate to set forth by our community, set forth by our community's majority vote. Thank you so much today. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Yesenia, or do we have callers? Yes, we do. Okay, and I'm not able to see whose hands are raised. So if you could just call those out, that would be great. I will say while, we're, oh, there we go. I can see them now. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just did want to say we do have an item later on on today's agenda on regular business about moving forward with an environmental impact report for the Santa Cruz branch rail line. And so um, well, that's People will have an opportunity to speak on that as well uh, later today. And um, so again, oral communications, a time for items not on the agenda. And with that, I will call on Jack Nelson. Okay, let me try that again. Uh, good morning, commissioners and RTC staff, members of the public. I'm Jack Nelson. I'm a retired land use planner and environmental planner, local professional, and um, I can't see you. I'm not in the room with you, and I don't know if you can see me, but I hope you hear my voice. Um, so in your August meeting now, we now have uh, a tale of two Measure Ds, the Measure D that was just defeated resoundingly on a pretty much single issue, and the voters, I think, are messaging you, yes, we want to keep the rail option going, if not at least available, if not moving forward right now. Uh, but there's another Measure D, as you know, that passed in 2016, the transportation sales tax measure. Now, I've heard some commissioners saying, well, we should proceed with widening Highway 1 because the voters approved Measure D and told us they want it. But I'd like to point out that that Measure D was quite a grab bag of mixed items and was not really marketed as widening Highway 1. It did include on the list reducing Highway 1 congestion. But on my ballot, it started off saying safety, pothole repair, traffic relief, transit improvement measure, and then in the smaller print started off in order to improve children's safety around schools. So you get my point. There were a lot of reasons that people voted for that Measure D. And some people I know told me who were bike advocates, they wanted the money for bike facilities, but that the Highway 1 widening was a <clears throat> better pill to swallow. So I suggest there is a limit on how much you can really say what was voted for on that Measure D. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Our next speaker is Michael Saint. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Brown. Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, CFST is not a litigious advocacy group. Uh, in the 22 years of our being, originally being sensible transportation and switching to sustainable transportation. This is our second litigation. And actually it also had to do with the Ox Lane projects back Mr. in 2010. Mr. Yes. Saint, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I know you're very familiar with the uh, oral communications format. We do have this item on our agenda later today. Um, we will be revisiting the decision on the highway environmental impact report. 
Okay, that was just my introductory. May I okay, continue? Sorry. Yeah, I'll go to something not on the agenda. Oh, go for it. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, we all know that car eccentric projects are going to fail. Um, none of them meet any of the promises to get Santa Cruz moving. In the past uh, few years, we've had experts that have spoken. This was called the Innovators in Transportation. We had four speakers. Nothing about highway widening was mentioned at that time. We also had a unified quarter investment study. Uh, the public spoke up there and chose choice B, which was primarily mass transit. Um, that was gutted by staff and replaced by staff's preferential choice, which put back in the car eccentric projects. We also had some uh, a little bit of light to the day for the CFST people when they did the bus feasibility study back in 2016. We were so happy uh, when a commissioner came to us with a report that the bus on shoulder was possible, especially four miles of the southbound shoulder. The RTC voted and put the bus project in the Ox Lane project, making the bus on shoulder ineffective to relieve congestion. We need to bite the bullet and tell the truth about these projects uh, that they will all fail. All of these studies and presentations, the RTC uh, reverted back to Oxlane project and the future HOV EIR. All of these studies and presentations were to help Santa Cruz to get moving, but were ignored by the RTC. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Okay, I see a member of the commission has a hand up and um, we are in oral communications right now. I will call on Commissioner Caput. Okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to say uh, hello uh, to Jack Nelson and uh, we got to get together again, okay? Uh, it's good to hear your uh, back uh, and participating in uh, uh, the community affairs. Thanks, Jack. Okay. Um, yes, I agree. It's good to hear your voice, Mr. Nelson. Um, okay, we will move on now. Uh, do we have any item three is additions or deletions to our agenda? Do we have any additions or deletions? We have no additions or deletions, Madam Chair, but we do have some handouts. We have the handouts for items eight, 24, and 25, and that those are all posted to um, our website. Uh, the handout for item 24 included a draft scope of work, and I know there was a lot of public interest in that. There's also a replacement page for item 15. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to our consent agenda. All items appear, um, one moment, <laughs> I see another hand up. I'll call on Commissioner Parker before we move on. Hi, thank you. You know, uh, I'm not seeing anybody that's live. So when voice, we just see Yesenias. Uh, so when we hear voices, if we don't know who you're specifically um, referring to, then it's just, uh, uh, I mean, we can kind of guess who it is. So is there a way that they can either just say, hey, this is, you know, say their name or you can refer to them when, uh, when, you, when they answer? I'd really appreciate that. Yeah. Unless there's some other way that I should be looking at it um, yeah, for this I hybrid. I'll um I'll do my best to track that and, and I appreciate that commissioners know um who's who's speaking. Thanks. Thank you for tracing that. Commissioner Brown, we are working on the technical challenges. Okay, and yes, we are working on the technical challenges. Oh, so no criticism well, intended, just trying to help the flow go. Thank That's you. All. Okay. This is Mike Rotkin. Um I do know there's technology that would allow us to have another camera that could then be integrated into this because I've been on a call where someone did that. So it's out there somewhere, at least for future meetings. All right, we will we will get there. <laughs> we will definitely get there. Thank you for the uh, recommendation. All right, um, so we will now move on to our consent agenda. Uh, this is items four through. Sorry, I'm scrolling 19 on today's agenda. Um, all items on the consent agenda. Um, are considered to be minor, will be acted upon in one motion if no member of the RTC or public wishes an item to be removed and discussed on the regular agenda. Um, so you may, members of the commission may raise questions, seek clarification and 
add direction to consent agenda items without removing them, um, as long as no other commissioner objects to that change. Um, so I will now open it up and ask um, if there are items that uh, folks would like to uh, have removed from the agenda. And I see um, Deputy Director uh, Mendez is, has your, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the commissioners asked a couple of questions about one of the items on the consent agenda, item 15, the uh, trail performance artists, and he asked me to, to uh, say something about the, those questions. Uh, it was primarily having to do with the uh, uh, recommendations of the prior audits that uh, one of the findings is that not all the recommendations were met during the audit, audit period. Uh, and uh, the reason for that was mainly uh, timing. Uh, so the uh, recommendations you know, were met subsequently, but it was after the, the audit period. Okay, thank you for that clarification. This is in uh, uh, connection with item 15, the transfer Development Act fiscal years 2018, 19, and 2020 through 20 or two 2020, 21 triennial performance audit report. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions on um, items that are on our consent agenda and or commissioners who would like to pull an item? Okay, seeing none, uh, I will open up the floor for a uh, motion. The, when I ask the public. Oh, mem uh, oh. thank you. I'm, I'm going to get this down. I really am. <laughs> so um, are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any items on our consent agenda? Uh, seeing none in the audience. Agenda. Second. Mike Rodkin, second. We have um, an attendee, uh, Brian Peoples. Okay, we have one uh, public comment on the consent agenda, and I will call on Mr. Peoples. Uh, hi, this is Brian Peoples with Trail Now. Um, addressing item number eight um, in full support of RTC staff. Um, it's uh, they're basically dealing with the uh, progressive rail that is working hard to leave Watsonville because of the uh, poor business opportunities for freight. Um, they have limited business there. So um, mm -hmm. I would expect that the Santa Cruz taxpayers may end up paying that bill, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think we need to start realizing that there is no f uh, significant freight and that's why Progressive Rail is working hard in, um, to leave our, our Watsonville operations. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you. Um, okay, returning back to the commission, I heard a motion and a second. Well, well, do we have a motion already? Or I'll make a motion to approve. We, we do have a motion, uh, right. Commissioner Caput. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Schifrin, seconded by Commissioner Rotkin, I believe. And uh, we'll take a roll call vote on that. Commissioner Bertrand? I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate uh, Lowell first? I vote aye. Commission Alternate Hernandez? You're muted, Felipe. Felipe, you're muted. Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Nope. Aye. Commissioner Parker? Yes. And Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. That passes unanimously. And for the record, I I'm sorry, yourself. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you. All right, uh, so we will now move on to our regular agenda and we'll start with item 20, commissioner reports. Are there commissioners who have something to report for the commission and the public today? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to our director's report. Uh, this will be an oral report from Director Preston. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to start today with a little housekeeping. Um, first, I'd like to thank our new transportation planner, Matt Schroeder, 
and our more seasoned senior planner, Rachel Morricone, for this month's legislative update, which was item 13 on today's consent agenda. Within the report, it's a couple of items that I'd like to call your attention to. Um, first, the Pajaro Station uh, project, um, including segment 20 of the rail trail, was not awarded funding from the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, or TERSIP. Um, we uh, applied for that funding uh, recently and uh, the awards just recently came out. Uh, staff has a debrief scheduled with CTC staff on why the project was unsuccessful and whether this project would be a good candidate for future rounds of TERSIP funding or whether there will be more appropriate funding sources for these projects um, which have strong community support. Um, in addition to mentoring Matt on legislative issues, and uh, Rachel is also mentoring Amy Naranjo uh, on programming. Uh, Rachel will be transitioning out of these two roles and leading RTC's upcoming uh, equity planning efforts as a result of our successful Caltrans planning grant for this study. Uh, next, I would like to thank our administrative staff led by Yesenia Parra with uh, assistance from uh, Krista Corwin and Cindy Converser on all their hard work throughout the pandemic and putting together our agenda packages, transitioning to 100% virtual meetings, and now today transitioning to a hybrid meeting format. Um, our intent is to continue to make AB 361 findings so that we can continue to meet in this fashion. As of now, the only facility that could host RTC's hybrid meetings is County Chambers, which we are occupying today. As of last week, we had conflicts in booking this room, but we are able to get those conflicts resolved. And we'll be able to use this room for the remainder of this uh, year's regular RTC meetings. Uh, we are currently working on next year's schedule and I have more information as we uh, get the PAC calendar booked. Uh, we're also working on changing the date of the next uh, budget administrative and personnel uh, committee meeting. I believe there's been some conflicts with some of uh, commissioner cal calendars. Um, I'd like to uh, announce the segment seven phase two groundbreaking. Um, the city of Santa Cruz and RTC invite the community to celebrate the um, very exciting uh, groundbreaking for the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 7 Phase 2 on Thursday, uh, August 11th from 1215 to 1245 at La Barranca Park, and that's at 700 Bay Street near the intersection of California Avenue. The project is the second phase of the rail trail project connecting the phase one trail that currently ends at the intersection of Bay and California and extending uh, it down to the, the existing cycle track and pedestrian facilities at the Santa Cruz Wharf. Uh, Santa Cruz Mayor Sonia Bruner will preside at the event. Speakers include RTC Chair and City Council Member Sandy Brown and RTC Commissioner and County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty, amongst others. Uh, free ballet, uh, service will be offered courtesy of Bike Santa Cruz County and we do encourage people to bike to the event or walk if possible. But if it's not um, possible and street parking is not available, attendees may park free of charge at the United Methodist Church at 250 California Street. And I hope to see you at the celebration. And then one last announcement, uh, Santa Cruz uh, Metro has hired a new general manager. Uh, on Monday, April 25th, new general manager Mike Tree took over the reins at Santa Cruz Metro. Uh, Mr. Tree has more than 27 years of experience in the public transit industry and local government management. His most recent experience as executive director of the Livermore Almondora Valley Transit Authority focused on increasing the agency's transportation options to improve ease of use and connectivity for riders. His leadership resulted in an increased number of rapid routes with 15 minute all day frequency, as well as expanded travel options for passengers with disabilities. While executive director at LAFTA, Tree also served as executive director for the Tri-Valley San Joaquin Valley Regional Rail Authority a new rail authority created by the state of California to plan and deliver the 42 mile seven station Valley Link commuter rail project. Mike and I have met several times since his appointment. Mike has offered his support for RTC's efforts to advance passenger rail on Santa Cruz branch rail line and is also looking for opportunities to maximize the benefits of bus uh, transit improvements that RTC is advancing on Highway 1 and on SoCal Drive. 
We have toured the rail line together and met with key staff by Caltrans Division of Mass Transit and Rail to discuss rail transit funding options moving forward. Mike is here today, and if acceptable to you, Madam Chair, I would like to invite him to the podium to say a few words about our plans to work collaboratively to improve transit options here in Santa Cruz. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I would invite uh, Mr. Tree up to uh, address the commission. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you on board. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's been a whirlwind of uh, three months. And uh, as soon as I got here, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to touch base with each of the board members at Metro. I'm excited for uh, what lies ahead with Metro. I think there's lots of opportunities and uh, many of them being really transformational. So I'm excited to be here, excited to work with you. Uh, I would like to tell you that I've been just really grateful for Guy Preston and for his staff. I, uh, When I came on board, I asked for a quick meeting and uh, the download on what projects of significance RTC was working on and certainly your rail project was was one of them. Uh, Guy took a whole day and as he mentioned, we toured the line. And uh, I've never been so exhausted at the end of a day in my entire life. Matter of fact, I got on a uh, weight loss program at Kaiser and have lost 23 pounds, Guy, since that day that we wa walked that line. But uh, I'm excited to, to assist and uh, uh, really positive comments from Caltrans from their division of mass transit and rail as we talked about uh, upcoming projects and in particular your potential rail line and I would just like to say that I fully support the recommendations that staff has before you today on your packet and with that I, uh, I just want to ap appreciate the opportunity again to uh, to introduce myself and thank you guy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your work. And we look forward to uh, moving forward on collaborating towards a, an integrated uh, public transportation system in our community and all of the improvements that that entails. Okay, uh, with that, we will move on to the item 22 is the Caltrans report. And I am not sure who is present to give that report. I only see certain faces on my screen. So it's, it's just... a, uh, Brandy Ryder. Brandy Ryder. Oh, hello, Brandy. Um, it's Ryder. Uh, you're up. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, Brandy Ryder here, uh, Office Chief for Transportation Planning in uh, Caltrans District 5. I have a couple of announcements. The first one being, I'm sure many of you have already heard that. Caltrans um, has a brand new director, Tony Tavares. He's coming from us or coming to us as um, our new director from District 7, where he was district director. Uh, he's also been district director in our Oakland uh, district as well. And as he joins us, he's bringing a, um, we recently introduced a fourth foundational principle for our um, agency, which is economic prosperity in our communities. Um, Caltrans knows that the confluence of jobs, housing, safety, and a clean California, as well as access, helps deliver the infrastructure necessary for a community to thrive economically. Some of the areas that we continue to make um, a priority are our SB1 projects, as well as our small business and uh, participation. We are looking, um, you know, at, in investing in transit and inner city rail program, active transportation and continuing our clean California initiative. Um, some other areas of um, priority for our, our agency are per people experiencing homelessness and as well as the broadband middle mile initiative, which is taken front and center with a lot of the new funding coming to us with broadband. Uh, I'd also like to announce um, some protect funding. So FHWA recently announced uh, a new protect formula program, which is bringing about 7.3 billion um, to communities to build resilient infrastructure. With that funding are not only capital improvements, but also planning dollars. And Caltrans is going to be, as part of our transportation planning program, going to be augmenting that planning grant program with dollars that will focus directly on uh, adaptation and resiliency pro, uh, planning efforts statewide. So as our transportation planning grant program is announced uh, in the next coming months and all of the materials start to come out for workshops, 
you'll see um, a very strong emphasis on resiliency uh, statewide. And then finally, um, their FTA announced uh, additional bipartisan infrastructure law funding to make public transportation and rail stations accessible for all. Um, they announced approximately 343 million available for the fiscal year 2022 in grants for all stations and accessibility program. Um, the NOFO for that is going to has been released, and so uh, we'll be working with your agencies on any letters of support or any um, materials as we proceed forward with a lot of these new federal funding programs. Uh, at that time, I have availability to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. Are there uh, questions from uh, the commissioners? I, I do see uh, Commissioner Caput, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, thank uh, Brandy uh, for the work uh, that has started over on uh, Highway 152 and Houlihan at College Road in Watsonville. Uh, we've been waiting a long time for that, and uh, it's good to see the uh, trucks out there, and uh, it'll be a great improvement for South County at that intersection. It's not too far from the county fairgrounds. So thanks a lot. And I think Lowell uh, sees the work going on out, out there also. And Ari, right. okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Caput. Uh, um, I know that that's one that you definitely have been thinking of for a long time. So on, I'm I'm glad to, to hear it's moving forward. Um, are there any other commissioners with comments or questions for Caltrans? Okay, uh, I will take it out to members of the public. And I do see one hand raised. I think it's possible that uh, Mr. Sandoval was um, planning to speak on an earlier item, but I'll, um, if that's the case, go, please go ahead and do that now, Mr. Sandoval. And I apologize if I missed you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, actually, apologies if I didn't mean to, but I mean, didn't mean to raise my hand. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, we're having a little bit tr of trouble hearing you. Um, you're, you're not breaking up, but a little bit muffled. Can you repeat that? Yeah. We lost. Him. Sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we will move on now to our next item, which is uh, an update on Scotts Valley projects. And um, we will invite Chris Lamb from Scotts Valley Department of Public Works to give that um, update for us. I believe, Mr. Lamb, you are on Zoom. So we'll make sure you're unmuted and you can go ahead. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, Chris Lamb, uh, City of Scotts Valley. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. I have a, a brief presentation to share. Uh, so, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair and, and Commissioners. Um, like I said, Chris Lamb, Public Works Director and City Engineer. Um, the City of Scotts Valley uh, is an update on, on transportation items in, in Scotts Valley. So last, last uh, spring, the city adopted an active transportation plan. Uh, there were over 70 projects identified in the transportation plan. And one of the activities that we went through in the development of our five-year capital program uh, this last uh, summer um, was looking at ways to, you know, identify how we can get a lot of those uh, accomplished over the next five years. So I think we're we're happy to, to share that we've we've got uh, a bunch of those projects included in our in our capital program. Um, a lot of them are are striping projects, so we're we're looking at uh, ways to incorporate you know those those improvements on uh, with, with other with other projects. Um, that, that are listed. Uh, we're also looking at uh, updating our, our pavement management program um, inventory uh, in this upcoming year. It was we have, our last inspection was done in, in 2017, so we're we're at the time uh, where we where we need to update that. 
Our, our CIP overall for, for is pretty aggressive for, for Scott Deli standards. Um, we have over 11 and a half million uh, programmed for, for this upcoming year. Um, and uh, we've, we've gone through some activities to uh, get staff some extra support to, um, you know, just the extra bandwidth to, to de de deliver those projects. So we have a number of on-call professional services agreements that we've executed this summer. Uh, for engineering support, for uh, project management support, for inspection support, uh, in order to get these to get these going, uh, we've also authorized a new FTE for for this upcoming year um, and moving forward, which is the senior civil engineer. And so I'm happy uh, to report that uh, that individual will be starting with us uh, next Monday. So uh, they'll have a a a busy uh, busy few weeks in getting up to speed, and then a lot of work to to get moving on. Um, uh, the the eleven and a half million dollars. Just wanted to give a, a quick breakdown of kind of where that money's uh, being programmed in in Scott Valley. So you can kind of see the the breakdown of twenty one percent over two million dollars towards towards transportation projects. Uh, the transportation section. So uh, these these are the these are the the full five year list of of the uh, the CIP projects in transportation, and I'll cover uh, a little more detail on on some of the ones that we have uh, money programmed for in in this upcoming uh, or current uh, fiscal year 2022-23. Uh, the the first one that's kind of underway and and. Um, Nearing completion of design is our Bean Creek Road uh, re rehabilitation project. So that's from Blue Bonnet Lane to Redwood Way. It's about a, a quarter mile of full depth rehab of existing pavement. Uh, we'll be striping and, and kind of really uh, defining the traffic lanes at, at 10 feet. Um, uh, there's a number of drainage improvements that we're looking to make uh, through this area. Uh, new guardrail um, and a sidewalk extension uh, from Blue Bonnet um, up to um, uh, Lakeview Drive, which is the the entry to the uh, Monte Valley Senior uh, Senior Community, uh, and then and Bike Sheriff. And, and so we're we're expecting that um, this this project will probably kick off construction in spring. Uh, just recognizing that uh, where we are right now. And the the kind of the significant amount of work uh, probably not something that we want to risk uh, trying to trying to do over the winter. Uh, we also have a a project uh, Mount Herman corridor improvement that so we have a number of uh, transportation development impact fees we've been collecting over the years uh, for improvements on Mount Herman. So we we've engaged with a a traffic engineering firm to to really scope out. Um, the types of projects that that we need to to improve um, uh, access management, pedestrian safety, traffic congestion. Uh, we have a number of our ATP projects identified on on Mount Herman um, uh, through through town. Uh, so we're, we'll plan on using this this project to really scope out those projects and then um, uh, as as matching funds to to um, apply for various grants uh, to to make improvements on on Mount Herman. Uh, Janice Way is a is a smaller uh, road in a, in a very industrial area in, in town. Um, the the pavement condition index um, as of 2017 was was in the 20s. Um, so so really um, poor poor pavement condition. Um, uh, we've we've done a, a few um, spot repairs over the years, but um, uh, the 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 whole roadway really needs to be uh, completely reconstructed. Um, uh, also uh, experienced demand for uh, sidewalk in this area and and a number of in employees in the area that that would like um, you know a little more robust uh, bike features that we would plan on including including bike sharrows um, in this area. And then finally, uh, our Granite Creek overcrossing project. Um, so this was um, uh, awarded a an our our stip grant uh, last last uh, fall. Uh, this project would uh, uh, provide for the maintenance and upgrades to the Granite Creek overpass. So Granite Creek is really the only uh, uh, crossing of 17 in Scott Valley that that has any type of uh, pedestrian facilities. So there's there's sidewalks uh, or an uh, asphalt path on on one side of the road, 
uh, we're experiencing some some um, uh, retaining wall failure that will be corrected as part of this project. Uh, we plan on uh, you know uh, widening the shoulder and, and providing um, bike lane, you know, class two bike lanes um, and uh, enhancing uh, the crosswalks on on both both ends of of the scope of of, of the project, which would which would be the, the portion that uh, crosses Highway 17. And that's 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 pretty much it for this this first upcoming year. Um, if there's any questions, I'm I'm happy to to take them. Um, or uh, for any members of the public that have questions on what's going on in Scotts Valley, uh, my contact information is is here attached. So that's that's what I have. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, really appreciate those updates. It looks like some uh, really great projects are going to be moving forward. Any members of the commission with questions for Mr. Lamb? I see Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris, for the updates. You know, I'd I'd like to emphasize just how important the ongoing remediation and thoughtfulness along Mount Herman Road. Why it's important is that it not only serves Scotts Valley, but it, it serves in, in many ways the 5th District San Lorenzo Valley, which is a corridor where we get a tremendous amount of traffic. And we're thankful for San Lorenzo Valley because they bring so much business to our city. Uh, they help um, maintain our businesses by their participation. And so um, I'm, I'm really thankful that uh, Mount Hermon is being attended to and looking for ways to improve that traffic flow uh, each and every day. And again, thanks, Chris. Hey. Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Rockin. I also uh, want to follow Randy's comments. It's also helpful to bicycle riders throughout the county. I use that route and, uh, occasionally on my just recreational rides. It would be very nice to have those improvements. Absolutely. Okay. I uh, do not see any additional hands up on my screen and no one else in the public. So we will now move on to our next item, which is item 24. This is a uh, request for proposals for professional engineering and environmental services for electric passenger rail transit and coastal rail transit project, the project between Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz along the Santa Cruz branch line. And we have Sarah Christensen, uh, senior transportation engineer uh, to give us a report. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, just a quick check uh, to the Zoom folks. Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Okay. I to see it. There it is. See it now. So we can see it in the chambers. If someone on the Zoom call, there can you is. see it on Zoom? Yeah. Uh, I see it on the screen on the. Yeah. We got it. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so Zoom folks can see it. Yep. Great. Okay, what's funny is you all can see it, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay. We'll test my eyesight. I see a small screen over here. Um, so this item is um, staff's recommendation is to release a, re a request for proposals or RFP to solicit um, professional engineering and environmental firms to submit proposals for a, a new project, the electric passenger rail transit and coastal rail trail project along the branch line. We do have a handout for this item. Um, we included the draft scope of work from the, uh, from the RFP as a handout. Um, so hopefully you could find that on our website. Next slide, please. Actually, let me see if this works. We found this and we're <laughs> see if it works. I don't think it does. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So again, my uh, staff's recommendation is to release the RFP with uh, commission concurrence today, hopefully, um, to uh, initiate this important project. Next slide, please. So the project description um, is really to convert our single track freight line uh, to a electric passenger rail system. Um, it's about 22 miles long between, um, sorry, I'm having a hard time, uh, Natural Bridges Drive and the Pajaro Junction, um, about 22 miles. It includes uh, the construction of passing siding, stations, um, operation maintenance, and storage facilities along the line, all of the infrastructure required to have a operating system. Um, this also will require uh, either replacement or rehabilitation of major infrastructure along the branch line. Um, we anticipate adjustments to horizontal and vertical alignment. Um, and essentially, um, the, the project will connect to the future Pajaro station that is under development by the Transportation Agency for Monterey County or TMC. Uh, another element of this project is uh, staff felt that it was wise to include the uh, remaining segments of the coastal rail trail within the transit corridor. So as you're aware, there's many trail projects that are under development between Natural Bridges Drive and uh, Rio Del Mar. So staff's recommendation is to include the remaining segments from Rio Del Mar South to Lee Road in Watsonville. Um, that's segments 13 through 17, as well as potentially in including um, portions of 18. And we haven't quite resolved um, or figured out um, between City of Watsonville and this project, uh, whether those will be included or not. Um, but definitely coordination will happen. Um, there's also the segment 11 project that's currently under development by the County of Santa Cruz. That project, uh, the ultimate configuration uh, includes uh, leaving a gap. So between the Cliff Drive parking lot and the Capitola Monterey intersection, there will be a gap and that's because of the uh, challenges associated with the replacement of the Capitola trestle. So staff envisions that that project of replacing the trestle, it will definitely be required for electric rail transit. Makes sense to also include the trail portion at that time. So closing the gap. So we're calling that segment 11 phase two. Um, also in the scope will be coordination with all of the ongoing trail projects that are under development. <laughs> Next slide. The electric rail transit um, portion of the project uh, is between the Pajaro Junction and Natural Bridges Drive. This is really um, the continuation of the refinement of what was identified as a locally preferred alternative in the transit corridor alternatives analysis, which completed in 2021. This um, analysis, I encourage all who's not familiar um, and who's interested in the project to read through that um, study and um, uh, the work by the selected consultant will essentially refine that locally preferred alternative and bring it forward into further development. Next slide. Here are some maps directly from the TCAA report. Um, this first map is commuter rail transit. The locally preferred alternative uh, included electric rail transit. So it could be commuter rail transit or light rail transit. This map is showing the commuter rail transit uh, with 11 stations, next slide. And here is the light rail transit option with the 15 uh, stations. Next slide, thank you. The coastal rail trail, as I mentioned, um, here's a map showing uh, the remaining sections of trail that are going to be included in the project uh, between Rio Del Mar and Lee Road, um, as well as uh, potentially portions of segment 18 in Watsonville, segment 19, which is along Walker Street, and finally segment 20, which goes over the Pajaro River Bridge and connects to the Pajaro Junction. And then in the top right corner, you could see the Capitola trestle. So this shows the gap closure that would be included in this electric rail transit and trail project um, as part of the replacement of that uh, major structure. Next slide. So the scope of work um, is to develop the project concept report 
and um, come up with a very stable project definition. In this process, staff envisions to have extensive outreach, community outreach, stakeholder outreach, coordination with local jurisdictions. This is a big project. It's going to go through every jurisdiction in the county. Um, there's going to be a ton of coordination needed. Um, there's some problems that are going to need to be solved. Essentially, we're proposing to do a lot of the heavy lifting early. That way we have a stable project that we can move forward into more refined and detailed preliminary engineering and environmental analysis. And we find um, that it's really important to do that heavy lifting early because what we don't want to happen is to go down, you know, uh, in more detailed engineering and environmental analysis and somebody come up with another idea and then we have to take a step back and it kind of slows the process down. So we really want to focus on this first step and it may take some time, but we, um, we really find that it's going to be really important. Next slide. So the funding for this um, contract, um, we are not recommending to program any funding yet. That will happen at a subsequent recommendation at a subsequent meeting. Uh, but we are targeting uh, competitive grant opportunities to fund this contract. The TCAA report, I believe, estimated this contract to be about $17 million. Uh, we don't have $17 million uh, available currently locally. So we are uh, targeting the state rail assistance program. They have a set aside for emerging corridors, such as ours, uh, that uh, they haven't had a, a call for projects in quite some time. So we're hoping to compete for those funds in the next year or so. Um, we are considering local funds uh, as a match because most likely um, the state rail assistance funding is going to be competitive. There's going to be a local match required. And so staff is uh, our working assumption is that a minimum of 20% is going to need to be put forward from local funds. Um, and we'll be programming or recommending programming those funds at a later time. And um, the other thing I just want to mention is that because we have limited funding capacity, um, this we really find that the prioritization of funding this contract is important. And so that might mean um, scaling back some of our preservation efforts for the time being until um, additional capacity becomes available. Um, and so um, this is really kind of our, our overall strategy and we'll be bringing more information at future meetings. Next slide. Here's our current procurement schedule. If we're ready, um, we're, we're ready to release the RFP <laughs> um, as soon as the commission concurs, um, as soon as today or tomorrow. Um, we are going to be soliciting proposals, giving about five or six weeks for consultants to put together proposals. Uh, so those will be due probably in late September. Um, during the month of October, we will be going through a selection process where we review the proposals. We'll have um, interviews of the shortlisted consultants. And then our current schedule, if we could get all of our ducks in a row, will be to come to the November 3rd RTC meeting with the recommended contract to award to the selected qualified consultant for this work. Next slide, I think that's it. Yep. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Uh, I will now take it out to members of the commission for questions. I see I, um, I didn't look to my right uh, quickly enough to see whose hand was up first. Um, I'll go with the Commissioner Bertrand. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> and then Commissioner Rockin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I didn't look to my right either. Mm -hmm. might have. <laughs> okay, I have two questions, sir. Um, one, I appreciate that you want to do the heavy lifting first so that, you know, later on, you won't have to go back and re-examine things to slow down the project. Um, for the public safety and mine, can you give us a couple examples of what you mean by that? Because I appreciate that. And my second question is, um, in terms of the engagement with the community, I totally appreciate that. I'm glad we're doing that. And we have done that in the past anyway. I just want to get a timeline when they would be brought in and at what stage, um, assuming this is granted. Thank you. Okay, so the first, the heavy lifting effort. Um, so developing a project concept report is really going to be taking the locally preferred alternative from the TCAA. 
and refining that, doing more detailed uh, ridership modeling. Um, that's going to be really important for the success of this project. Um, there's going to be some engineering done as well. We've never really had um, a consultant layout, you know, how this is going to look, where the passing sightings are going to go in order to get, I think the TCAA said 30 minute headways. That means we need a certain number of passing sightings. Where are those going to um, be located? Um, those are the kinds of questions that um, we hope to answer and um, of course, the locations of stations is going to be a very iterative process. There's many of them. It's going to be multi-jurisdictional. So we anticipate um, those types of, of things being brought forward, bringing the information forward so that the community understands what the um, project is proposing. And this commission has sufficient information. To yeah, like if we have good connections with uh, Cabrillo College or Dominican so passengers could get off, that kind of thing. Yes, sure. Okay. Yes. And the other thing is the timeline that public would be involved. Are, are you thinking of different times as the project unfolds or at some point in the development after it's been granted? Um, we don't really have a full-blown strategy. What we're, what we're seeking from the professional consultants is um, obviously we want them to come up with with somewhat of a strategy and an approach and obviously work with our staff and kind of refine that and figure out something that's going to be um, appropriate for um, our community. Obviously, our community is very engaged and um, sometimes other communities elsewhere may or may not. So every community is different and we staff plans to develop that um, outreach plan and strategy with the consultants hand in hand to um, come up with something that's really going to work for us. Okay. Commissioner Rockin. Uh, thank you. There, there are three uh, issues. One, uh, traditionally when uh, RFPs are not sent out for massive public input, you know, they're developed by staff and so forth, but the commission and the public have a right and appropriately to weigh in before you award the the contract, which I think is an appropriate way to face this. I don't think any, well, I, there may be somebody, but most of us do not want to start and like do another TCAA in order to get to the RFP. And I think we appreciate the way staff has sort of prioritized moving this forward quickly. So I just wanted to weigh in on that on that question. Uh, I, I do appreciate the staff having published the draft, at least uh, in its current state on the on the website. So members of the public can see that we're we're putting out planning to put out an RFP that's a vigorous uh, commuter passenger rail system. And that that's important, I think, to many members of the public. Um, my second issue is sometimes you're more successful at grants with overmatching the local match. And I wonder whether there's any consideration of bonding the 8% that's in the uh, 2016 Measure D to bring forward, you know, to, for example, propose a 30% match as we go after this funding. I, I don't know enough about the details of whether in this case we need a overmatch, whether we're just, you know, our project is so attractive that we can just, you know, we'd rather pay less if we can get away with it. But, but if it's, you know, consideration might be where there is lots of competition for this, uh, we should think seriously about how we could, a 30% overmatch might well be in our best interest. So, is there any thinking about that question? Yes, actually, um, I think about that all the time, <laughs> Commissioner Rockin. But um, we, you know, what we really need to do is get the cost proposals. That's going to be informative because we'll, then we'll know 20% of what, right? Sure, no, that's helpful. <laughs> so that will be important. Um, but then um, the guidelines for the grant programs haven't come out. And so we don't know what the requirements are really going to be. We're just kind of trying to be proactive and plan ahead. Um, and then finally, um, looking at our pay-as-you-go capacity in light of those two things, um, we're going to be making a recommendation at a future meeting, um, most likely to for pay-as-you-go to fund at least the first parts of the contract, whatever we could afford. Um, and if we are at a point where you know, the delivery of the project is is put to a halt because we like run out of money or we're not successful in getting grants. I think that's the right appropriate time to start looking at potential financing options. And um, staff is always looking at that, but it's good to get this feedback so that we could bring this information when we um, are recommending programming for Measure D. 
for this contract. Thanks. Yeah. And my, my final comment or question, it's a question really. Um, we need to, uh, the engineering study needs to look at the alignment of the track, both vertically, there's places where it's kind of underwater near Watsonville. Um, and there's uh, and horizontally, which you've talked about both of these, there are places where a 10 mile an hour freight train fell off the line, you know, near La Selva Beach in the past. So there's places where the curves are too sharp and need to be fixed for a, a rap, more rapid uh, passenger service. But another consideration would be where are there places that where the alignment could be adjusted so the trail would have more space, you know, for a wider trail or less constrained or make it cheaper or quicker to bring the trail in if it weren't, if the track were moved over slightly. And I'm wondering whether we're at, asking specifically in this engineering study for them to look at that consideration along with, I mean, it can't be the primary consideration. We have to make sure the passenger thing works, but, and this is not a proposal to tear out tracks, but it's a question of whether we might move that track over in a way that would help the trail project. Is that being under consideration as well. That absolutely is. And that's why we want to include the portions of the trail um, that are not under development to um, be included in the engineering work for this project. And then um, coordination with the um, projects under development. We obviously don't want to create more problems for ourselves by building one before the other. We want to coordinate. We want to uh, make sure there's no throwaway costs or having to rebuild something that was just recently built. So these are all really good reasons why we should really get going on this engineering work so that we could um, solve all these um, issues. And it, you're right. It is smart to look at the whole corridor and fitting both in with all the alignment considerations. I mean, you're right. There's going to be some alignment corrections because our line is a 10 mile an hour freight line. It's not for fifth, you know, high speed light rail or, or commuter rail trains. So there's going to be quite a bit of um, alignment uh, fixes. Thank so. you for your responses. Very helpful. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to go next to Commissioner Schifrin and uh, I do see the hands raised in the Zoom. So I just wanted to let you know, um, Commissioner McPherson and Commissioner Quinn, you'll be up next. I have three uh, quick questions. What is the concern project is going to do out the it's cutting uh, out the freight easement? I'm sorry, maybe your microphone isn't on, Commissioner Alternate Shepherd. Is this better? Yes, way better. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm asking about the freight easement and there is a mention in the scope of work task one that uh, uh, under the task that it will look at the freight and passenger rail operational capacities, but it isn't clear that the project is going to um, assume the retention of the freight easement. Is that the case? At this point, um, I think that question will be solved by the work that will be undertaken by the consultant. And, and I don't know if he, Luis or Guy want to add to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment more on that. This is Guy Preston if the video is not on me. Um, this is a, a freight railroad. Um, and so the going into this study, absolutely, the, this is going to be looked at as a uh, a rail facility that it would be capable of um, both freight and passenger rail systems. Uh, saying that, we do need to to really understand what that means in terms of positive train control, um, uh, system capacity, and whether or not a temporal separation would be necessary uh, to allow um, all that uh, capacity on the line to to be able to meet our performance measures. I understand that it's uh, uh, there are issues. But I think it's important um, for the public to understand that this is not an, going to be an intent to uh, a backdoor intent to get rid of freight. Um, so, you know, what what happens through the process um, is, you know, is going to look at a variety of alternatives. But uh, there is no, as I'm hearing you, there is no intention to eliminate the freight easement as part of this process. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, the second one is just to sort of clarify what you said um, about the Capitola trestle. As I understand it, and I think it makes sense to look at the trestle as a separate 
phase of the segment. Uh, I think that may be necessary with other portions of the different segments as well, given the complexity of some of the uh, work that needs to be done. But I wasn't quite clear what you would, uh, what that, what was being proposed. As I understood it, the phase two would look at having um, either replacing or repairing the trestle so that it could serve both rail and the trail. Am I understanding that correctly? Just one minor correction is that the, um, the bridge needs to be replaced. I, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm the bridge sorry. needs to be replaced. So there's no option to repair um, because of the, the wrought iron section over the Soquel Creek. That's really, um, it's a, over 100 I thought I'd old. try to slip that in. Uh, <laughs> you know, not, uh, it's, uh, it's not the way it's been analyzed. But the real question is, will the um, the project include both rail and trail? Yes. And then my third um, question, you know, we've gotten requests that the commission, that there's all sorts of can upgrade uh, or that not all sorts, but there is a poss possibility of construction funds to upgrade the track um, that the commission could be applying for. And my understanding is that one of the uh, objectives of doing the study that's being proposed is that uh, in order to really compete effectively for some of these construction funds, we need to have an EIR, we need to have a project defined so that when we go to the potential funders, um, they you know, we're, they, they will know where we're going and that there's a commitment to go there and there's an analysis that supports that. And, you know, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the limitations of our funding and, um, you know, the staff capacity of how much you can work on. Um, so I'm, you know, I think it makes sense to go in the direction you're talking about. But I also wanted to respond to that concern that there may be these other funds out there that we could get right away uh, and make some major upgrades because um, my sense is, and that's what I'm asking you, is whether we really do need the environmental document and the project definition and some design in order to compete effectively for other funds beyond the you know, the emerging corridors fund that we are going forward uh, to help fund the uh, this project itself. Sure. Um, that makes sense. It does. My it, question makes sense. Okay. It does. And, and staff's approach to this, um, this electric passenger rail project is that this, this major capital project is going to be competitive and eligible for outside funding. And that's really what we need in order to get anything done on this branch line. We need outside funding. We don't have enough funding locally to do all of the repairs to reactivate freight or have any kind of rail on this line. It's a fixer upper, if you will. So um, in order to be eligible for those funds, we need to prove project readiness. We need to make investments, smart investments in the local match amounts. And that's what we're proposing now. And there's this other kind of um, idea or strategy that um, I've seen a lot of the public comments about, um, you know, applying for say $25 million of funding for freight. Um, and the, the program that comes to mind, we monitor pretty much every program and um, come up with strategies on how to get grants. We're pretty good at getting, <laughs> getting grants. Um, the RTC staff is uh, planning group is really great at um, writing applications and, and getting ahead of these things. So the TSEP tra uh, trade quarter enhancement program is a large program through SB1. And that is really um, focused around freight. Uh, we've looked at this program extensively. And this is just one example to kind of explain, further explain our strategy um, of, of moving forward with this option that, that we're proposing today. So the TSEP grant program, um, if we were to say apply for, you know, $25 million, for example, of TSEP funds, um, if you read through the guidelines, they require a 30% match. So 30% of $25 million is $7.5 million. What's also challenging about this program is pre-construction phases of the project, which we 
um, would need another, you know, five to 10 million, depending on the project that's scoped, um, is not an eligible component of the project. So we would also have to locally fund an additional five to $10 million in pre-construction efforts to get this project eligible for these funds. So that's essentially emptying out all of our local capacity um, and potentially more um, in order to apply for a $25 million grant. And within the program years of that grant, it's only, you know, they come in cycles, two year cycles. So the program years are through 2025. So we'd have to start construction by 2025. And based on our local measure D capacity, um, the numbers just don't pan out. We don't have enough money to pay for pre-construction and the local match to do something like that. Um, and Would so, the 25 million be sufficient to make the uh, entire line of freight ready? Not necessarily. Um, the Capitola trestle alone, which is um, out of service and requires replacement, um, is estimated between 15 and $30 million. So um, that's just one bridge. <laughs> so even if we got the $25 million, it would not, and we spent all our local funds to um, move forward with the construction, it would not be sufficient to make the, uh, the line um, usable for freight, let alone anything else. It, it may not be. And, and the, th the way it's really interesting because I just see these numbers kind of just thrown out. And the way that staff does it is we, we usually scope a project, come up with the cost, and then we figure out how much money to go for. And it's kind of, I've seen ideas come out of just, you know, um, apply for $25 million. It's like, well, what are you going to get for that? <laughs> so I can't really answer that question because this is just kind of a con conceptual idea of, um, you know, an interesting idea as to, you know, why we aren't, why we aren't pursuing the TSEP funds. And I think TSEP is a great program. I think that that is a um, program that we should be targeting in future cycles, but um, not for this cycle. That's so if I understand you uh, correctly, the problem isn't so much that we don't have a project design or an environmental document. The problem is that if we, um, in order to get the program, it, we would exhaust all our funding. Right, and we couldn't move forward with and this we couldn't move forward contract. with this project. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Could I have something quickly on that item? Go ahead. I also would point out, because I looked into this, there's a lot of letters from people asking us to consider it. Um, my understanding is we'd be in competition with people that are running active freight service right now and short of the... Uh, ability to sort of meet our existing customers and we'd be putting in a bid for a project that might have potential future freight uses and where there's literally no interest currently. Um, so I think we wouldn't compete very well, even if we made everything else happen. So it's one more reason that this might not be a great time to apply for that money. That's what I found when I looked into it and I was advocating for it and pushing it. And that's, that's what I sort of found by looking into the issue a little bit. Right. Um, and just to <clears throat> add to that, the, um, each grant program usually requires a cost benefit analysis and that benefit part of the cost benefit analysis is, um, you know, how much freight demand do we have on the line? And if we, you know, in Watsonville, we have freight um, and that's how we were able to um, be successful in getting a grant for the repair of the Pajaro River Bridge. But that's really the only area that we can compete for. Um, and... Uh, that's yeah, you're right. One more reason. That's it. Okay, um, we will now move to commissioners joining us uh, virtually and I'll call on Commissioner McPherson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome uh, and appreciate uh, Metro GM uh, Michael Tree being here and his expressed interest in cooperating with us in this rail adventure that we're about to get into. Um, and I want to thank the um, RTC staff for bringing this recommendation forward. Uh, I have a couple comments that uh, I think just need to be uh, be clarified. Uh, too often, the RTC staff have been inappropriately maligned for not seeking grant money to proceed with the passenger rail project. And that simply is not the case. 
Some people may say that the RTC uh, SAP is recommending this item now because of the outcome of the recent Measure D, but that's not true either. The staff is bringing this forward now because they see a potential funding opportunity for an approved project on our unconstrained or unfunded list of projects. That is their job and they do it well. I'm gonna support the staff recommendation because it's time we quit fighting over perceived facts. And that's what a lot of people have been throwing out there regarding the challenges and costs of building passenger rail service. Uh, an EIR now, I think we'll do enough to, uh, project design to identify all the issues and challenges with the associated costs included. Uh, the prior studies we have done have done more over than ballpark costs and issues, which unfortunately opened the door for radically different interpretations of the information provided that we've seen uh, with the divisiveness within the community regarding the passenger rail. So we need better answers, and I hope the state will be willing to award the grant money for us to get the information we need to get this project uh, moving to a feasible standard with accurate cost estimates and all of the challenges clearly identified if this project is to move forward. So again, I appreciate the staff and what it has done at the right time. And I just wanna say that uh, they have done a great job under the circumstances, under a very controversial issue. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Uh, Commissioner Quinn. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Sarah, for uh, addressing that so clearly. Uh, following up on what Commissioner McPherson said, there, there's a lot of uh, selective uh, interpretation of the data that's out there. And one of the pieces of data I didn't see mentioned in the proposal, but is mentioned in a lot of the correspondence I poured over is greenhouse gas. A and will uh, some variable regarding greenhouse gas, which has really been used by both sides in this dialogue, uh, be addressed at some stage in this so we can we can use it as a North Star to help guide these decisions? Yes, um, the environmental analysis includes air quality um, studies and uh, also, yeah, that would, that would be where, I'm just trying to think of if we could get that information sooner, but that would come through the environmental analysis process, the technical studies. Helpful, thank you. Okay. Are there any other commissioners with questions at this time? Okay, uh, so we'll take it out to the public and uh, we will, I'll invite members of the public who are present here to come on up and uh, speak. You'll have two minutes uh, to uh, address the commission and uh, and then we will uh, after we uh, have members of the audience who are here in person we'll go out to uh, the callers okay uh, you're up Mr. Scott thank you Barry Scott I live in Aptos um, and I thank uh, Andy especially for the questions about freight uh, I, I noticed in on page one of the what was released is uh, on this item. Freight in the city of Watsonville, including Walker Street, uh, s seems to imply n no freight on the rest of it. And I hope that I hope that we uh, I hope that the uh, study includes freight capability that doesn't doesn't exclude freight capability at some point in the future, um, because it's not just for freight movement, but it's also emergency response and. Uh, and recovery and uh, and the like. So I, I, I'm confident that we'll be wanting to keep the freight capability. I noticed in the slides that it, that it named CRT, commuter rail transit, and, and not light rail transit, but the TCAA suggested both. And commuter is heavier and more expensive. And there's a little bit of concern on our rail supporting people that this may develop a project that's another $500 million project that's just a, you know, a Cadillac uh, compared to what could be possible, like a, ba a light rapid streetcar battery operated vehicles that are, that are, that are neither uh, commuter rail nor traditional light rail. So I hope that we'll be looking at those technologies. Um, I, I encourage, and, and I'm happy to see in item eight and consent agenda work on the, uh, repairs as needed. And I hope that that continues. Uh, it's really important that we keep our, our rail line working. 
I hope that uh, the the study will include possibilities for a for a phased implementation uh, and not and ways to fund something that can be done in pieces. Maybe uh, Santa Cruz to Capitola while Murray Street Bridge is under construction, expanding in both directions over time, and maybe starting in Watsonville with a with a service that would take them to La Selva and the beach, and and maybe meet in the middle one day like. Uh, like we did with the transcontinental railroad. So, you know, it's one thing to study what would it cost to do a big thing and another to, to study how can we actually get something happening and maybe maybe sooner than later. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Scott. All right, our next speaker, you're up. Hi, thank you. My name is Lonnie Faulkner, Director of Equity Transit, and I'm from the Live Oak area. Thank you, Chair Brown, commissioners and staff. I just wanted to mention my earlier comments since this is the first official meeting after um, the vote, That's that was a more general comment, but this is in regards to item 24, so thank you. Oh, wow, we are absolutely thrilled that the RTC staff is taking step forward, implementing passenger rail transit for our county and proposing to initiate the preliminary engineering and environmental review phase and proposing to initiate um, the uh, environmental review phase, as well as seriously seeking funding in support of this goal. We urge commissioners to vote yes on item 24. We are so excited also to hear that Mr. Preston and Mr. Tree are already working together on creating a robust transit system for our county. Our community members have been active participants alongside the RTC for over two decades, assisting in the purchase of our rail line, volunteering at rail and trail community meetings and events, getting involved with the myriad of studies required in bringing passenger rail service to our Santa Cruz branch line, and I might add, working to initiate and support the development of a world-class trail. We look forward to and appreciate the opportunity to review and provide feedback on the scope of work and plans as this project moves forward and serve in partnership with the RTC in support of clean right rail for our community that will connect us, not just between cities in the county, but will connect us to cities throughout the state of California via the state, the inter, uh, state rail network integrated with our Metro bus system. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Our next speaker. Hi, I'm Sally Arnold, and um, it's really exciting to be here in person again. She's like, whoa, it's like, I don't know, it's like, um, just very exciting. Um, we're really pleased to see that the RTC staff um, have clearly been working over the summer uh, on this big project, um, and that we see that speedy uh, response to what was uh, really a uh, landslide defeat of Major D and really showed that despite, you know, there are a minority of people who, you know, hate the idea of a public transit on our tracks, the vast majority of people want it. And it's an incredibly popular project. And you have a chance to work on this really popular project now. We're excited to see that you've move so quickly. Um, we're excited that the draft RFP has been made public and I was just looking at it for the first time as we sat here, but obviously we haven't had time to read it. And I assume most of you haven't had time to read it either. And that we probably all would like to read it uh, carefully and offer comments and questions um, to, you know, because as many of you ask questions here, you know, it's like, there's a lot we don't know yet because it just came out. So um, thank you very much for your work on this important document. And I'm sure we will all be having comments and questions on this RFP and we're excited about the project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, welcome. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, David Van Brink. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of this because uh, Sally just said it all much better. Uh, but I was going to work the phrase paper tiger somewhere into that. Um, uh, but in, in, to get to the end, uh, uh, please approve this staff recommendation, perhaps incorporating some of the uh, wise suggestions offered by others of the uh, public and commissioners uh, to ensure a speedy and high quality and flexible product. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'll now call on uh, members of the public who are uh, signed on through uh, their phone or through Zoom. And it looks like our first virtual speaker will be uh, Brian Trail Now. Hi, this is Brian from Trail Now. Um, we oppose moving forward with the RFP because it's not realistic. Um, 
we forwarded you legislation from California Transportation Commission, Caltrans, California Coastal Commission, with all strict policies addressing sea, sea level rising requirements and the restrictions on building on the coast. We're seeing existing rails in Southern California having to be moved. And so if you look at those regulations, you'll know that this proposed project will never be funded. It's not eligible for funding. We believe that this will delay continued building of the trail that is vital to our community. Santa Cruz is not eligible for state funds to build a new fixed rail on the coastal corridor. The coastal corridor is 20 feet over by New Bright from the coast. In Manresa, it's falling into the ocean and the Coastal Commission is not allowing you. What we believe is the message from Measure D, 2022 Measure D, is that the community does not want trail only, but they want transit and trail. And there are much more effective ways to invest in the corridor than a fixed rail system. And spending money on a fixed rail system that you will never get funding for by the state continues to delay the construction of the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. Please don't go down this path because it's the wrong direction. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Nelson. Yes, uh, hello, commissioners. Um, well, it's a joy to see this item on your agenda. And I urge your commission to vote yes on this. I'd like to uh, mention, I had a chance to ride the Coast Futura unit down the tracks. And that makes me think about how many people haven't had an opportunity to see this corridor and understand what a sleeping giant it is. And so I'd like to, uh, during this item, just urge you to look for ways to get something on the tracks that people can ride as, you know, just as a kind of um, intro view of what we've got in this corridor. And uh, when our planners and consultants are looking at things like where can sightings go, I'd like to see them also looking at uh, the affordable housing opportunity sites along this rail corridor. Uh, do I need to underscore the connection between affordable housing and access to a, um, a light rail station uh, that takes people where they need to go for their employment and so forth? Um, I'd also like to echo what Barry Scott said about let, let's uh, keep in mind a kind of project that's in scale with our community. It doesn't need to be heavy. Let's not make it heavier duty than it needs to be. Let's keep this affordable, light on its feet, and perhaps ready to go sooner than later. And lastly, um, as a Sierra Club member, um, you may already be aware that the local Sierra Club has steadily supported having rail transit on this corridor. Uh, the Sierra Club <clears throat> opposed the Greenway proposal, that measure D, and um, this is potentially a very environmentally friend, friendly gas greenhouse gas reducing project. So I'm excited. Please go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, our, I, just before I start, I continue calling on members of the public with hands up. I just wanted to remind folks out there who are listening, if you'd like to speak on this item, item 24 uh, on today's agenda, you can uh, raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone if you're on your phone or the raise hand function on your Zoom and uh, star six to unmute yourself or the mute button, um, just as a reminder. And uh, for those who are um, wanting to, to weigh in. Uh, okay, our next uh, speaker will be Michael Saint. Hey, uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Uh, just a few comments. I'd like to thank Sarah 
uh, Director Preston and all the staff for really jumping on this uh, issue quickly and wanting to get it get it underway. Um, also, I have a question. Basically, is is there a chance of um, moving funds from some other projects that we have um, funding for? And and of course, you know, I'm going to go towards the Oxlane project where there's. Uh, most of the funding is going presently, plus the uh, California Transportation Commission awarded $107 million if we were to go for a less expensive project, i.e., uh, just, um, excuse me, just wide, uh, widening. <coughs> just widening for the uh, bus on shoulder only, that would leave maybe a several million dollars left over for the rail and trail. Uh, also, is this EIR RFP item going to include study of the rail trail? Why can't we use some of the 17% left over uh, from the Measure D funds from 2016 for the uh, rail study? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Okay, our next speaker is Mark Johannesson. Sorry, uh, I was uh, muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Brown and Commissioners. Uh, just a couple of comments about the draft scope of work. Uh, when scoping the RP, it's going to be important that the consultant look at all available rail transit options and funding mechanisms, uh, because as you know, the past consultant uses an example, heavy electric passenger train system, which wouldn't be compatible with the Santa Cruz community. Uh, or the shared use of the branch line, and that led to this misleading or in $35 million cost estimate the consultant gave for a rail system, which would not be acceptable to the community. So the project should work toward a system that fits the community and its needs and is economically feasible, and have a report that focuses on that and can be used to move the project forward, which includes light rail, uh, wireless rail options, which will have an impact on the preliminary engineering analysis, system design, such as stations, signaling, sightings, and others. Also, ridership modeling, which is part of the scope, uh, is not the same as a true ridership survey, which would be provide a more accurate projection of ridership. And be careful about over-engineering this project. The commission should focus on a system that is cost-effective, uh, compatible with the shared use of the branch line, and can be implemented quickly. And also, the consultant should also be scoped to look at a public-private partnership, which can help with strategy and approach, funding options, it could drastically reduce the cost and staff time and also reduce the implementation timeline. This could be part of the conceptual cost in those estimates and risk analysis. So staff's estimate for the cost of this work is 17 million. To put that in perspective, that amount would buy eight of the wireless trams recently demonstrated on the branch line. It's about the cost of new track, which would be needed along the entire line for a passenger rail system. And we'll also go toward paying a significant amount towards remediating the track. So excessive consultant costs have killed projects such as this. Consultants don't have a vested interest in project cost containment, and that requires commissioner and staff diligence. Finally, in selecting a commission, look for value, and a consultant has worked on a similar project that was actually implemented and be careful not to choose a consultant just because that uh, consultant has a history with the RTC or staff. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Schonbrunn. Good morning. Uh, I'm the president of the Train Riders Association of California. We are rail advocates and come to you today with a different point of view. After hearing multiple mentions of RTC's fiscal constraints, track urges, my track is the Train Riders Association of California, track urges a low cost path forward for rail implementation. We believe that path involves another source of funding, namely a public-private partnership or PPP. That's why we are here today to oppose today's staff recommendation to proceed with studies. We think this delays rather than advances rail transit. I've been involved with public sector rail projects for over 20 years, including high-speed rail. 
I haven't seen successful projects come out of the public sector. <clears throat> My organization believes that private sector entities that are willing to invest their own capital represent a very different way forward, one that requires much less public sector funding. The good news is that the RTC is already aware of private sector interest in the branch line. TRAC, my organization, recently completed an economic study of the potential for a PPP here. We are convinced that the demand for access by tourists could power commuter rail on the branch line. We urge the commission to table the staff recommendation and substitute for it an invitation to private sector entities to submit proposals to RTC. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We recognize that this is off the beaten path kind of comment to you. Thank you, Mr. Schoenbrunn. Our next speaker is Mark Masidi Miller. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair Brown, staff, commissioners. It is great to see this item on the agenda. Please move forward today. Um, yeah, I want to respond to a couple of comments. First, I appreciate that you're trying to get the heavy lifting done first. And I suggest and recommend that you start the heavy lifting by seeking input from stakeholders on the scope of the work. Uh, releasing a scope of work, you know, hours before this meeting is just uh, doesn't give anyone a chance really to weigh in. Um, and in that regard, uh, I didn't see a lot of information in the scope of work about the trail. And the trail is going to be built before the rail uh, passenger rail is instituted. And you need stakeholders from the rail uh, trail community. I also was glad to see General Manager Tree making a presentation about collaboration, but I don't see any role in the scope of work for Metro. It seems like Metro would be an integral partner on this project, given that adding passenger rail will increase public transit ridership from 14,000 to 34,000 rides a day. Um, regarding funding, everybody's talking about the rail bucket, Measure D rail bucket. But there's a trail bucket that has money in it also, and that bucket was intended to pay for things like storm drainage improvements and topographic surveys and boundary surveys necessary to move forward and get the trail built ASAP. Um, and so there's money there, and that money should be uh, allocated appropriately to this effort. Um, lastly, I really appreciate staff's focus on proving project readiness. That is an essential component of this effort. And I just want to remind everyone that the public is certainly united behind this effort. 73% of the voters said go. The naysayers are a small minority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masidi Miller. Our next speaker is Bruce Sawhill. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, Chair, Commissioner, staff. Um, I've been involved in the Santa Cruz branch line one way or another for 18 years, mostly as the chair of Fort. Um, I, in that time, I put tens of thousands of words out into the conversation, but today I'm not going to do that. Early on, I felt like Jack LaLanne trying to pull a train with my teeth. And uh, I found out that if you got a lot of other teeth involved and did it for a long time, well, trains are low friction and eventually they move. And uh, that's what's happening. So today, no words, but I'd like to express myself musically and my sentiment about item 24. So I have a 25 second excerpt of music here that I will play. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sawhill. 
was going to ask if it was dancing music, but mm-hmm. now we know. Thank you. Uh, okay, our next speaker is Joanna Lighthill. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you for considering my comments. Um, I have I echo uh, some of the comments of, I've heard today. I think that the voters really do want affordable uh, transportation and transit in the corridor. Um, I'm not sure if it meant rail, but if that's what you choose to go forward with, so be it. Um, what I would like to do is ask the RTC before endeavoring into a big study and a very expensive study, very expensive project to possibly just reevaluate, revisit the TCAA. Um, I think there's a lot of important information there that was kind of overlooked about the benefits of the BRT or the bus transit on the corridor. Um, this, of course, has been going on for years. Uh, the, the RGC studied an alternative analysis in 1998. It was called the Major Transportation Investment Study. And it was then that consultants recommended a busway on the corridor. The RTC dismissed the bus at that time and opted to look at a recreational rail. Uh, they did a couple of EIRs and they they uh, failed, or I'm not sure why the, the project was discarded, but there are two uh, EIRs out there that possibly we can look at um, to evaluate what's what's coming on this larger project. Um, the TCAA, um, the uh, BRT scenario in the TCAA had almost the same route that was recommended in 1998. It didn't use the entire corridor, but the advantages of the BRT were kind of uh, downplayed in my opinion. I think that the scenario offered the highest frequency, more stops, it was more affordable, more funding. So I hope that before you jump off this um, into this project, you'll reevaluate the BRT and maybe just take a quick look before spending so much money. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Kyle Kelly. I'll make it quick. Thank you all, commissioners. I uh, just want to say I support the staff's recommendation. Uh, I'm really glad that, that we've gotten to this point and that we can seek an RFP. Uh, and I think there's been enough other comments similarly expressing support. So I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Okay, next up we have Sean. And Sean, you can press star six to unmute yourself or use your Zoom. Yeah, got it. In taking a phased approach at building this system, uh, you could target the uh, Apple commuter benefits of these large companies that send the Lux buses up to, uh, up to Santa Cruz. Um, and um, and uh, UC and Cabrillo, they both have mandatory transportation fees that um, that give uh, all, that allows all their students a, a, a metro uh, bus pass. So there's income right there, but it would also have to include the uh, uh, the satellite uh, Cabrillo satellite extension at uh, in Watsonville, which would serve uh, downtown Watsonville as a whole. The uh, the Vision Santa Cruz County project. Let us know that the coastal zip codes uh, through which the uh, uh, the rail runs, there's a higher percentage of people living with disabilities, and that uh, that that number is going up. There, um, if anybody thinks that there is a that there's going to be less of a need for accessibility in the future, we expect you to speak up and voice and voice that opinion. Accessibility is not just about a ramp. It's about lighting. It's about the frequency of stops. It's about how early and late it runs. And uh, accessibility all the way down um, uh, to, to the stop. And also, um, 
and also Paracruise. So you can stop cutting that and, uh, and, and uh, sending that money to, uh, to, to roads and put it where it belongs. In time, if cities want to, they can uh, make a requirement that uh, the last mile, instead of, say, being taken up by, uh, by, these, uh, by these companies that run the Lux buses, could be run by local companies if they like. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Linda Wills Husen. Hello. This is Hi. Linda Wills Husen. Hi. Um, thanks for acknowledging that you can hear me. Uh, this is Linda Wills Husen. I'd like to uh, thank the staff and the commission very much for moving forward with this key project for our county. I'd also like to echo earlier comments that it's very important to kick off this post measure D rail process with a commitment to adequate public review and comment at every stage. This includes making time this month for public comment on the draft scope of services for this RFP. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and uh, final speaker. So if anybody out there is wanting to make a comment, please do raise your hand now. Otherwise this will be our final speaker on this item, Salad and Sale. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, uh, Salad and Sale. I live in the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you, Chair Brown and commissioners. Uh, I want to uh, also thank uh, staff for moving forward decisively. Uh, and uh, in concert with the uh, expressed uh, feelings and desires of uh, the citizens of the county. Um, I support this proposal and encourage your yes votes today. Um, I think uh, the uh, refinement of this project description will be essential um, as it is uh, the uh, about to let an RFP for the largest infrastructure uh, project in decades uh, in Santa Cruz, so it's really worth getting it right. Um, I want to echo Mr. Scott's suggestion uh, to include an option for uh, uh, early incremental implementation uh, of such a project. Um, I think that uh, getting something uh, up and running uh, between Capitola and Santa Cruz um, is imminently doable, and uh, this doesn't have to only be considered in terms of the massive all-in-one project, uh, which ultimately we'd aspire to. Uh, also, I like the uh, idea of the South County leg from Watsonville, perhaps up to La Selva. Um, I'd also like to uh, be sure that the uh, uh, conceptual proposal for service that was advanced last fall by Roaring Camp and TIG M uh, and uh, was not given much attention at the time, be really looked at seriously um, as part of an incremental implementation strategy. Uh, there's, uh, I think, working with uh, a valuable longtime local partner like Roaring Camp is really an essential part. So thank you all and uh, looking forward to moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sale. Okay, I do see two more hands up, and so I'll call next on Casey Beyer. Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown and Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, briefly. One, uh, I worked on the 2016 Measure D campaign to make sure that we had that uh, th those funds available for future transportation improvements throughout Santa Cruz County. Uh, and I'm delighted that the voters uh, in 2022 have confirmed the efforts that took place in 2016. Uh, I've read the staff reports and I've been involved in many of the meetings over the last five plus six years. Uh, and I want to congratulate the staff for a report. Uh, uh, I can look at it from a uh, of a high perspective or dig into it, but I won't do that for this comment. I just want to thank the, the commission for taking this uh, item up today, and I'm hopeful that you will vote in favor of moving it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beyer. Our next speaker, and at this point, final speaker, is Gregory Becker. Uh, good morning, commissioners and staff. Thank you for item 24. Santa Cruz County needs a comprehensive plan for bringing rail with trail to Santa Cruz. 
The plan should detail the cost, benefits, environmental impacts, and funding feasibilities in a report that encompass the entire scope of project. Santa Cruz taxpayers need to know what they are committing to, how much it will cost, how long it will take, and what the impacts on our transportation and climate crises would be. Both train and trail supporters can support RTC Agenda Item 24, Environmental documentation, documentation for an Electric Rail Transit and Coastal tra Rail Trail Project. Uh, this will be a necessary precursor for the tax increases and bonding. Thank you for your work and thank you for this item 24. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Okay, seeing no additional members of the public, uh, I'm going to uh, bring it back to the commission and I will call on uh, Commissioner Schifrin, uh, raised his hand early. Um, so I will call on Commissioner Schifrin and uh, Commissioner Rotkin, um, and then I'll um, get to members of the commission who are on our screen. Okay. All right, I wanna thank uh, the staff for their presentation and work on this and the, the speed of their response to moving this forward. I would like to move the staff recommendation. Um, I have some comments afterwards if I could make them, assuming there's a second. I'll second and follow with comments after Mr. Schifferns. I wanted to ask a question of staff. One of the um, com, uh, people who testified talk, uh, talked about, you know, working with the private sector. Um, um, I wonder if that you see that as a potential part of the project in terms of uh, and where in the process it could possibly occur. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, the TCAA and business plan did talk a bit about um, public private partnerships and um, it, it had that as one of the options for future um, delivery and, and operations, but um, really the, the first step of, of any path that we take really is to define the project and to complete the environmental review. And then, um, you know, after that, we can look at other options like a P3. And um, the reason we want to do that is um, so that this commission uh, retains control over the project and we can um, define the project that this community needs. Um, and then P3 is an option. Um, so as I understand it, what you're saying is that as part of a construction financing um, process, uh, looking at the option, trying to coordinate with uh, private potential private sector funding is certainly on the table. Uh, sure, that and operations. And if Guy, if you want to add anything more about um, or Luis about P3s and sure, um, I've done extensive investigations into public-private partnerships, um, both here at RTC and, and my prior career at High Speed Rail. Um, public transportation is not a profit-making endeavor. Um, it's highly subsidized. Um, there's a lot of capital investment that's involved. Um, when we um, looked at it at high speed rail and was hoping to get some public money invested early in, in the project, we found that the respondents um, stated that the initial capital cost um, would have to um, be invested first by the uh, public agency and that the more appropriate time to involve a, a public entity would be as more of a concessionaire. You meant to uh, involve a private, private entity. Private entity, entity yeah. I'm sorry for misspeaking and thank you for correcting me, would be more would be more at the um, the end of the the, the project approval uh, when you're looking for a concessionaire to possibly run run the system. I don't know how popular that would be here. I've also talked to Mike Tree at uh, Metro about possibly running the service at a later time. Um, uh, there, there's definitely advantages to going uh, private versus public. Um, there's strong uh, support by um, Metro to, to, to possibly work uh, on a concessionaire sort of a, a, an agreement. Um, but right now, I think we need to complete the environmental review and figure out how we're going to pay for the capital costs. When we 
received proposals in the past about privatizing this line um, uh, last year. Um, those proposals were for the RTC to come up with the initial capital cost to do the, the big repairs. And that's kind of the linchpin in all of this. And to get those repairs, we have to do the environmental document first and then apply for um, state and federal grants. So there could be a role for, for public-private partnership in the future, but it's not right now. And, and as Sarah articulated really well, um, we wanna be able to control the, the scope of this project moving forward. Um, and that's, um, you know, a lot of the comments that I've heard about the scope of services and what's in it and, and what's not, um, that's still going to be negotiated out and the commission's going to have an, another opportunity to see that as a final scope of services in a proposed contract when we come back. Um, trying to spell it all out now um, to um, a great amount of detail, um, you'll get proposers trying to play to that. You know, our 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 um, ideas about how to do this is we really want to see the consultants come to us with their approach of how this is done. And then in that first task, which we spelled out, you know, um, pretty, pretty comprehensively about what we're trying to accomplish, and that is a stable project definition. A lot of the comments that we've heard here today about what the system should really provide? What's the purpose and need of this project? What are we looking at in terms of service? Are we looking at 30 minute headways or are we looking at 15 minute headways? I've heard a lot of people say, we should be delivering 15 minute headways, but do they understand that that means doubling the amount of passing sightings? 30 minute headways is three passing sightings. 15 minute headways, you may be looking at possibly double tracking the entire line. So if you go too far down doing your analysis and then you come back and you say, well, you can double your ridership if you have 15 minute headways, well, that's a different project, you know? And that's why this first stage is really important and where the public process is going to be extremely valuable so that this commission can truly understand the project that it, it's looking to move forward with or not. Thank you for more than answering my question. <laughs> And one one other thing, if I if I may, this isn't a new project per se. It's it's been in our RTP for quite some time. M majority of it is on the unconstrained list, so we are going to need to receive additional funding. But this is a project that's been contemplated for a long time, and um, you know there's still going to be a lot of hurdles moving forward. But but it is going to show a commitment to. Um, to, to funding the project by coming forward with these initial steps. And there were also really great comments about, um, you know, how are we going to be looking at greenhouse gas emissions? And, you know, how what would we do in the first stages of this project to kind of dispel some of the myths? And, um, you know, I heard comments about tying this to housing and, and transit-oriented development, and we included that in our scope of services because it's important in understanding what the ridership potential really is. And that would really then determine what your greenhouse gas savings would be um, by building a project of this nature. So um, Commissioner Rodkin, you said you wanted to make comments. I'll, I'll give yes, you, thank you that opportunity now. Several um, short, thankfully, I think short ones. Um, first of all, the public can certainly give staff, and I would assume that the commissioners would be copied on it, input on the RFP that they've seen in the on the website. Um, I don't think, I'll speak for myself, I won't say what everybody wants. I, I don't want to see us start a whole other study process that takes this backwards in which we hold public hearings and you know, do a follow up on the TCAA to figure out all over again, restudy the question of whether a bus or, you know project would be a better project. I, I don't think that's helpful at this point. I'm really excited that our staff are moving forward with the light rail project that I think most people have in mind. And that I, I assume the commissions will at least the, at least the investigation of which the commission will support at this point. Um, second point, when people talk about PPP private, um, you know, public uh, projects, that's essentially in most cases an anti-union proposal and it's going nowhere in this county. 
We couldn't even run the paratransit service, which was originally in the private sector, without bringing it inside of the transit district where they have union drivers. And so people need to understand that, you know, one of the ways those projects are pencil out and look effective or look like it's a great idea is by underpaying the people that do the work. And I don't think that's going to be accepted in this county. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm not saying we shouldn't look at private, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's going to be some unionized or highly paid without unionized for that matter and, you know, well-benefited system of private involvement. But I'm skeptical about it. And uh, people under, I should understand what when people talk about PPP, that that's really what they're talking about is making it on the cheap by not paying the people that do the work adequately. Um, on the question of freight, um, it's tempting to think about um, building this system uh, adequate for a light rail and not and for to carry heavy freight. But the fact of the matter is, whether you support rail banking or don't support rail banking, it's not likely to happen in the short term. And I don't think we're going to adverse abandonment at this point. We looked at that earlier and it was not a, exactly a positive response from the public to that. And so we basically have a right of way in which part of it, it's owned by the people with have fee, underlying fee ownership. And if you don't want to trigger a bunch of taking suits, you better keep moving ahead with planning this at the level of freight. Now, again, there may be some ways to sort of in the interim build stuff at less than full freight capacity. But if you build something that needs to be torn out later than re to, in order to bring back freight, you're probably triggering a taking suit. And uh, I'm not saying anything that everybody doesn't understand. And certainly the people who, the attorneys that are out there already fishing for customers um, to sue, the, sue us over this issue understand that fully. And I'm not giving anything away by pointing this out. So this is going to have to, again, how freight will integrate with, with passenger service, totally unclear. Probably has to be temporal separation, if nothing else, but we can't afford to build a bridge that will carry a very light train over it and stuff, and then have it trigger suits that have us lose the right of way for both the rail and the trail. It wouldn't be smart. Um, the, um, I guess my, my last comment, and my, I hope the most important of these, I am so excited at what our staff has brought us today. I think we made such a great decision when we hired Guy Preston for this job. Um, I think the staff that work with him, Sarah Christensen and our engineering services that she brings us and all the rest of the staff, it's, I'm just so pleased that this is in front of us and that we have this moving forward in a vigorous way. It's um, This is a watershed moment. And I think people will look back in the future uh, and see that this was the moment where we really decided to move ahead with a public transit system that's vigorous enough to really make a difference in terms of climate change issues. Um, and that's not to say we still have other don't have other options in terms of bus on shoulder and other things going on as well. But this is really a, an important project for this county. And I'm, you know, it, you're, I've been in public life. Uh, let's say I was since I was elected to the city council in '79. That's a while ago. Um, I can't think of a meeting that I've been at where a more important decision has been made than the one that's in front of us today. And I mean that quite seriously. This is, you know, I, I think um, we, we have in front of us the possibility, and again, it may not pan out. You, sometimes you make decisions and it turns out the final cost comes together and it's not feasible and none of us are gonna vote for something that's stupid and doesn't work. But to investigate this possibility to move forward with it vigorously in a positive way, hoping that the outcome will be positive. I can't think of anything that's been more exciting to me in all my years of public service. So I wanna thank our staff for having brought this to us today. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Uh, Commissioner Caput, you're up. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, Guy Preston uh, for a very sensible uh, plan and uh, also thank uh, Chevra for your presentation. Uh, we're, we're talking about actually going forward and uh, that's what's uh, so important about this vote today. Uh, we've we've done uh, about two to three years worth of talking, and now we're actually deciding. And uh, I do like the uh, uh, comments of you know it's it's going to be done in stages. It's going to be done in uh, phases. And uh, the only way to go forward is to approve this uh, proposal, and uh, we'll work out all the details uh, later uh, as best we can. But uh, and uh, if has there been a motion and a second? I I, I we have. Know, a, 
There has. And we have a motion second. I'm sorry, Commissioner yeah. Cabot, our, our, uh, we have well, two who, commissioners who, who are who quite- made the, who, who made the second? I did. That was Rodney. Yeah. And, uh, how about this, Mike? You let me do the second? I'll, I'll be happy to, sir. I'll be happy to remove my second and have uh, Greg Caput substitute for me. Go ahead. Right, well, uh, thank for, you. For the minutes, we can uh, give Commissioner Caput credit for the second on that. All right. Now, our previous second is amenable. Thanks. Okay, uh, and I just wanted to clarify. I believe, uh, Commissioner Caput, that your uh, appreciation was intended for uh, Sarah Christensen. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our senior engineer. Okay, uh, our next up, Chris, uh, Commissioner uh, Brown, Kristen Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, and of course, thank you to our staff and um, Director Preston for all of the work on this and all of the items that you put forward uh, before us. Always appreciated. Um, I, I don't think it's a big secret uh, that I, since joining the, the RTC board, have been somewhat skeptical of, of rail transit in our community. And I'm, I'm still not completely convinced of the feasibility or practicality, but that being said, um, I think if there's anything that Measure D did, it showed that the uh, those who showed out to vote have very strong opinions on what should be done with our rail line. And I feel like it's my responsibility as an elected official to do what I can to represent um, those who have made their voices uh, known, especially uh, in, in that particular vote. And so, you know, with that being said, I am prepared to support this recommendation and, and to move forward with, um, as I believe it was Commissioner Rodkin said, um, you know, investigations into whether or not this is, you know, feasible and practical for our community as we move forward into the future. Um, I think it's going to be important. And uh, if, if things go well as, as we move forward in this process, then, you know, I'm hopeful that I will be able to say that I have been wrong in the past. Um, but for today, I am prepared to support staff recommendation and, and the uh, motion that's on the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker, uh, next Commissioner uh, Shabra Kalanjari Johnson, you're up next. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Shabra Kalantari Johnson, and I do serve as an alternate for the Metro Board on the RTC, um, but not needed as an alternate today, so I'm speaking as a community member. Um, I also want to thank the RTC staff and the Commission uh, for bringing this forward and for considering it. Um, I think it's a, it's the right direction, and um, I'm glad that we're taking action on a very necessary step. I'm also really glad to see our new general manager, Michael Tree, here today and engage in this conversation because I think we really will need cross system, a cross system approach and collaboration um, to ensure that the project that we move forward with is successful. Um, and I know this isn't before us today and it may seem far off, but to the point that Sarah made and was in the agenda report, the more ready we are, the more others will want to invest in us. So I think we do need to think about local funding support for the operations of the rail line once we have a rail line um, to make sure it's affordable for everyday people. Again, it may seem far off, but we should start thinking about that. And I would support the RTC exploring that when the time is appropriate. So thank you again, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to chime in. All right, uh, next up, Commissioner Quinn. Oh, thank you, Chairperson. I just want to echo what um, Commissioner Brown said. I'm a designated alternate and not an elected official. But as Bill Nye, the science guy says, what data would change your mind? And if the answer is none, then it's not worth having the conversation. So I very much look forward to getting some data that is you know, spun either way and gives us some real cl clear compass points in which to navigate going forward. Hey. Chair, Brown. Chair Brown. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Vice Chair Koenig, you're up. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think it'll come as any surprise to people that I don't believe we'll ever be able to create modern passenger rail service on an old single track freight line. But I'm willing to be proven wrong. And I certainly believe in democracy and the voters have made themselves very clear that they're not ready to leave the rail option behind. So I fully support this effort to get more information for voters about the type of service we'll be able to deliver, the amount of money it will take, and the amount of time it will take to deliver a project. And if I'm proven wrong, I would honestly be overjoyed because I want nothing more than to see carbon-free 
effective public transit in this community. And one way or another, we're going to work uh, together to get that done. And if, in fact, passenger rail is not feasible, then I hope it'll at least be clear that it's the facts that make it infeasible and not any individual or group being obstructionist. And so again, uh, in the spirit of moving forward together, uh, I fully support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Commissioner Randy Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do think that the, the vote on Measure D allows us to kind of take a second look at rail uh, in, in honesty, uh, being forthright, um, and actually looking at the data that emerges from this. Uh, I think our response should be measured and uh, look for facts as they come forward. Um, is this kind of a, uh, the starting point expensive? Well, I would have to look at that, see what kind of RFPs come back, whether or not to see if they're uh, worth the cost of investing in something like this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I would caution the commission, however, that, you know, when I speak of honesty, um, there was so much alacrity with progressive rail and every instance in which people kind of said, is there really enough business there? Should we actually invest in that? Is this the right partner? And those people who put up uh, a little bit of, I guess, interference, if you will, that maybe we shouldn't uh, go ahead with progressive rail, were kind of put down as you're being obstructionist and you're not listening to the facts. Well, progressive rail was a total abject failure. And I just want people to kind of, given that fact that we, when things fail, and have the possibility of failing, we're at least on, honest enough to recognize that and admit that to the public that this really is not going to work. But uh, absent that, I think um, moving forward with at least a preliminary and seeing what uh, is offered with an RFP, um, I can support that. Thank you. Thank you. Call the question, I guess. Okay, um, if, if I could, as the chair, uh, make a couple of comments <laughs> before we uh, take the vote. Um, I just want to, uh, so most of my questions are all, my questions and comments have really been um, said and my, my questions asked and answered. Um, but I, I did just want to say a couple of things. Uh, you know, I've had the privilege of serving on this commission. Uh, you know, I came in uh, right after the 2016 Measure D vote, and I have been able to, and, and it's been great to serve on a commission where we've had, for the first time in a long time, resources to expand uh, transportation infrastructure services and really have funding to do a lot of the things we we know um, are needed in our community or, or wanted in our community around active transportation, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, it's so it's been uh, wonderful. I've been supportive of moving forward in the direction we are uh, about to, I believe, take a vote on to move forward today. Since I uh, came onto the commission, I um, had hoped that this decision would be made sooner. Um, and But here we are. And so, and it is a, a really uh, momentous decision to be taking this step. Um, I, I do think that uh, success or failure uh, is contextual. And um, so I'm looking forward to getting additional information. I'm getting, I'm looking forward to getting um, the, the information we need and that is needed really to, uh, to, to bring uh, trust in our community uh, by outside funders uh, from the state and the federal government um, and, and other possible funding sources to make this happen. I do think we will need a local funding source at some point um, as uh, uh, Commissioner Alternate uh, Kalantari Johnson suggested. And um, so I'll look forward to those conversations. Um, I wanted to ask, and then I also really want to thank staff. I mean, you have, uh, you've been through this, um, you've been working really hard to deliver projects for our community and it's not easy. Um, and it's, it's made more difficult when there are issues are very contentious in our community. And I think you've really kind of rolled with the punches <laughs> and um, I appreciate your, you know, all the work you've put in to get us to this point today. Um, I have a, a lot of a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for your work. Um, 
So I um, do have one last question that I just wanted to raise because it came up a couple of times uh, in public comment and I've heard it before related to, and I know we're not there today, but I just wanted to ask um, related to the local match and the potential for future actions on the commission to come back and, and where that local match money might come from being measure D. Um, do you anticipate that given that the um, trail is being incorporated into that, that funding from Measure D's, um, uh, the, the other bucket might be, we might be able to use that as well, or is all, it, it, it's, there seems to be a suggestion that would be the, uh, the rail uh, portion of the Measure D funds that would be used, but is there possibility for using other uh, another bucket to help support that in some way. I'm really I say, I ask this because I'm very much concerned about uh, preservation and maintenance on the rail line, and I I recognize the challenge that we have there. Um, and I've also heard, talked with uh, Director Preston about uh, you know really making me aware of um, how problematic it is when we the deferred maintenance right. And and so I, I just wanted to ask that question real quickly yes. um, before we take the vote. Sure. Um, so in the staff report, we do actually talk about the coastal rail trail portions of the contract being funded um, by Measure D Active Transportation, which is for the trail. The Active Transportation category also, um, also can be used for um, maintenance, such as drainage maintenance, vegetation, um, and dealing with encroachments, property management issues, and all, all of that. So um, those two funding sources are available to us, but I will caution, <laughs> both are very um, impacted. Uh, we have a very robust uh, coastal rail trail program and we just made a big programming decision back in May. Um, and so we will take it back to the drawing board and, and program as much as appropriate for between trail and rail, but ideally we get most of this funded by the state or other outside sources. So absolutely. Yeah. And, and I do recognize that both of those pots of funding are, are limited. Uh, I just wanted to make that clarification now. And if I can clarify a little bit more too, the, the first um, task, the concept report is gonna be pretty much uh, rail um, oriented. So we do expect it to be more heavily funded from the rail pot than the trail pot. Um, we think there's only so far we're gonna be able to get with our local funding source. Um, we do plan to come back um, to the commission with a request for programming for um, the rail pot. We have not um, had our public hearing this year yet on the rail five-year plan uh, we have on the trail. We may have to amend that if we're gonna fund some of it. As we get the scope of services locked down, when we see the proposals, when we can see the hours allocated to the various tasks, we can better determine what that split would be. Thank you. And then lastly, I'll just say for uh, members of the public who have uh, asked to um, have some input into the scope of work in the RFP process. I think um, we've heard uh, from staff uh, about the, um, the kind of the rationale behind how we're moving forward. But I will say, given that the scope of work was uh, just made available and I myself have only had a chance to pass my eyes over it. Um, if you do have questions, uh, I'm, I will just offer that I'm willing to try to um, get your questions answered if you wanna contact me directly. I tend to um, be more rapidly responsive to uh, to communications that are, are addressed to me directly rather than um, ones that come to the commission and then we see them in the log. So um, I'll just say that for members of the public, I will try to help you um, get questions answered as we move through this. And with that, I will call for a vote. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner Parker? 
Commissioner yes. Ned Hurst. Aye. And Commissioner Johnson. Okay. That was unanimous. And you did hear uh, Commissioner Parker. I did. Okay. Uh, great. So thank you, everyone. Um, we will now move on to our final item for today. That is uh, item 25, a response to the court uh, ruling on a CEQA challenge of the Highway 1 Tier 1 High Occupancy Vehicle Lanes Project. And uh, uh, Sarah Christensen is back, at, <laughs> back to give us a report. Thanks. Thank you. She never left. Thanks. Um, no PowerPoint, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, here today to recommend that the RTC um, authorize um, an amendment to a consultant contract uh, to provide technical support to address the court ruling, which is attached to the staff report, on the CEQA challenge to the EIR uh, for the Highway 1 HOV lanes um, analysis. Part of the uh, recommendation is to program and budget uh, in this current fiscal year surface transportation block grant funds and exchange those funds for uh, regional state transportation program exchange or RSTPX funds in this current fiscal year to fund this contract amendment as well as project management um, services um, and efforts to complete the work. So just a little bit of background here. Um, this um, was a pretty major effort over many years um, by this commission and partnership with Caltrans to prepare this EIR. Um, it was uh, circulated in 2015 and into 2016 and finally certified in 2019. Um, the CEQA document was challenged um, and uh, we've been staying tuned on the court um, process. Um, there was a lot of delays through the court process because I think because of the pandemic, um, but we um, there was a hearing that happened and the ruling came out. So the ruling um, on the challenge by the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation, who is a plaintiff against the EIR, um, it was denied in part and successful in part. Uh, the court rejected the majority of the claims um, and the ruling addresses really the programmatic level analysis for the HOV lanes. If you recall, um, there's the project level analysis that's required for any project to move forward into implementation. And then there's also kind of a programmatic level uh, analysis that could happen that um, kind of sets the vision, the long-term vision for the corridor. And so um, the challenge and the ruling were both about the programmatic level HOV lanes along Highway 1, which was uh, selected as the preferred alternative for the project. Um, the court um, orders a recirculation of a focus CIR um, to address three topics, uh, one being the um, HOV lane baseline year of 2035, um, updates to the project description, and then um, including health effects for mobile source air toxics or MSATs as it relates to the HOV lane project. So um, very focused areas that need to be recirculated for public review um, and comment to um, address the court's order. So in order to do that, um, the arrangement for this project, just to jog your memory, um, the RTC is the implementing agency for the, um, it's called the PAED phase or the project approval environmental documentation phase of the project. So we're responsible for uh, doing the work, preparing the document. We hired consultants to do the work um, previously. And Caltrans role is they serve as the CEQA lead for the project. So they're the ones doing the certification um, and they also provide oversight. So we work hand in hand and um, our technical consultants prepare the work, they review it um, and essentially adopt it. So um, our recommendation is to um, authorize an amendment for the technical work to proceed um, and work with Caltrans to comply with the court's order. Uh, and just a few um, other notes, um, just based on 
um, concerns that, you know, from public comments and everything that's been um, circulating around out there. But by uh, recirculating the focus CIR um, and going through this effort, it doesn't guarantee or mandate that HOV lanes will be built. It doesn't approve the project to move forward. Any project that is um, implemented needs a project level analysis. So if at some point the commission decided to do HOV lanes or anything else on the corridor, um, a project level environmental documentation would need to go um, forward and be completed. So um, another point is we have a cooperative agreement with Caltrans. We're the implementing agency. We need to prepare the information, work with Caltrans. And that's why we're recommending to um, to partner with Caltrans and, and finish the job. You know, this was a big investment by the commission, took many, many years to complete. Um, and we wanna, we wanna um, complete that. So um, with that, staff's recommending to following the court order and honoring our cooperative agreement with Caltrans. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation. Ready for any questions. Thank you. Um, okay, I um, I did see uh, Commissioner Schifrin uh, asked to be called on for questions, and then um, I don't see any hands on the screen. I'll go to Commissioner Rotkin next. Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you. The staff report recommends using STBG funds for the $250,000. I have a couple of questions about that. One, can STBG funds be used for projects other than highway projects? Yes. Question two, why is the recommendation for STBG funds as opposed to Measure D highway funds? So STBG funds are discretionary. Um, uh, they're up to this commission to program. We usually go through a process every couple of years to um, distribute these funds. And uh, the reason we're not recommending at this time to program Measure D is because um, the Measure D program in the expenditure plan does not explicitly call out HOV lanes. So um, it does talk about congestion reduction, um, but we don't wanna leave um, any gray area. And so we're recommending this STBG source of funds for this work. So are you saying that Measure D funds couldn't be used for an HOV project under Measure D? I, I'm not gonna say they could not be used, but what staff's recommendation is to, um, because it's not explicitly stated in Measure D, which was voted upon, we're not recommending to use Measure D for that reason, because it's not explicitly called out. Are all the auxiliary lane projects that we're pursuing called out explicitly in Measure D? Yes, they are, because um, the original Measure D passed with ox lanes between SoCal Drive and State Park Drive. And then if you recall in February of 2020, uh, we went through a process of amending the expenditure plan to explicitly uh, add between State Park Drive and Freedom Boulevard. And those, those are the entire extent of all the ox lanes in our so development. So is there anything that would prevent the commission from uh, amending the expenditure plan to explicitly include funding for the EIR recirculation from, uh, um, from Measure D funds for that HOV project? That's a possibility, but that's not today's recommendation. There's a process. I think it's a, about a month and a half or two month process to do that. And we want to get going before that. Um, uh, let me ask what's the, uh, since there's no funding for the HOV project itself, what's the rush? And especially as I, if I'm remembering correctly, it took about 10 years to get the original EIR done for that project. Uh, what's the hurry of, I'm a, just a little concerned, I guess I should be clear, using funding that could be available for other kinds of projects um, besides highway projects when we have 
what is it, 40? How, what's the percentage of Measure D that goes for highway projects? I mean, it's the, 20. It's the biggest percentage and um, or one of the biggest percentages. It's certainly bigger than the percentages for the uh, projects that I'm most interested in. Um, taking money from a pot that could be used for those other projects for um, a long term um, highway project, if it's ever going to be built, um, just doesn't seem reasonable to me when it would be possible to take that money out of the uh, Measure D highway fund simply by you know, doing what we've done before, which is adding it to the expenditure plan. Yeah, th those it's are okay. my questions. Okay. Thank you. We could consider bringing this back um, at a future meeting if uh, that's the way that the commission wants to go is we were wanting to move forward a little sooner, but if, if that's what we want to do and preserve the SCBG for other uses, uh, we'll take that direction, obviously. Thank you. Hey, Commissioner Rockin. Well, first of all, I'm sympathetic to the concerns that Andy Schifrin raised. I don't know if the public follows this exactly. I actually, I read every word of this legal decision by the court. Frankly, it's one of the more bizarre, I'm not an attorney, but it's one of the more bizarre decisions I've ever read because what it says, if I understand it, I'll be corrected, please, if I've got it wrong, is that um, you don't really have to fix, you have a project in which you have a tier one project, which is the vision of a, in 2035 of an HOV project, which I don't know that we're really committed to, and that the Measure D voters were not told, what wasn't impossible, but they wasn't emphasized in any way, whereas the auxiliary lanes were. And it says in the court decision is go ahead with a tier two project, which is build the auxiliary lanes, and you don't need to fix the underlying, um, the court recommends that we fix the tier one environmental work, but you don't need to do that to go ahead with your auxiliary lanes, which I always think if you have an under, if you tear a second tier off of the first tier, you got to fix the first tier before you can do the second tier. But the court says, no, you don't need to do that. It's a little bizarre. But that, if I understand it, that's what they're telling us. $250,000 is not chump change. It's a significant amount of money. And as someone who does not support, who supports the auxiliary lanes, I don't, I don't like them. I don't think they're going to be that effective, but the public asked us to spend the money on that. And I think we should always spend the money on what the public tells us to. So I'm in support of the auxiliary lanes, but um, I'm not in support of the HOV lanes. The public turned down a chance to support those in the past on a vote. It's a half a billion dollars for that project. In the end, you have to fix every bridge on the, on the way to make it happen. And as uh, Sarah Christensen just told us, we would still have other decisions to make before you could actually build that HOV project. So it sounds like what the court's saying is, we'd like you to kind of fix the environmental stuff for this thing you don't really need to have in order to move ahead with any of the practical things you really want to do. So Andy's suggestion, and but on the other hand, Caltrans wants us to do it, I understand. And the court said, you, you know, we'd like you to do it as well, although they don't order us to do it, to do anything we want to do. We, if we, so what would the consequence, I'm not asking this as a question, in my head I'm asking this question, what would the consequence be of just not doing, not, not spending the money, not doing the environmental work and just move ahead with the projects we want to actually do? Short of that, if since we want to be partners with Caltrans and we don't want to have a fight with them about stuff, and we need to work, and they've been very good about working with us cooperatively on things we care about, Andy's suggestion that at least we pay for this out of highway money and not out of things we could spend on other things we care about is very attractive to me. And I would like to get us in my question at the end of all this is, is it possible to put this off till our next meeting to get a sense of whether we could take, you know, take an action? And it wouldn't be just to have a vague discussion, but to have in front of us the option of possibly funding this out of highway money rather than these other more, more, um, fungible, more open-ended kinds of possible funding. That, that's my question, really. So I'm going to reiterate some of the things that, that Sarah mentioned, and it's certainly possible to amend the expenditure plan to add HOV lanes to it, but there also could be unintended consequences associated with that. Um, there's a lot of people that don't support HOV lanes, and then you'd be adding it to the extent expenditure plan. Um, 
I understand the concerns about spending money on on this that could be spent on something else. Um, at this particular time, um, we feel we got one ruling from the court um, and it told us to recirculate the document and provide additional information to the public to cure the document. It's a fairly um, inert cure and it's something that can be done and it would provide additional information and show the court that we're committed to following their order. Um, uh, we think that that's in our best interest um, at this time. Um, we we can certainly look at other avenues moving forward, but um, to, to, to really ensure that there's no um, issues with this ruling whatsoever, we think it's um, best that we move forward and um, and honor what the court asked us to do and that we show them that commitment today. Swanson. That's it. Hey, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, did you have questions? Um, a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for reading uh, emails from the public and you did answer my first question. Um, I read the uh, decision, you know, we're sort of talking about whether we should uh, comply with the ruling. So I was trying to understand some of the points. So the baseline issue uh, came up in my mind and I was just wondering if you could explain that to me a little bit better than I was able to understand it. Sure. Um, so and my understand, I'll, I'll paraphrase um, and try to explain the way that I understand it is uh, in the draft document, there was a baseline year um, identified for the HOV lanes, which I believe was the same as um, what you would typically do for a project level analysis. So say it was 2015 at that time. Um, and then between the draft and the final, it was changed. And the reason for that change is because HOV lanes are not approved to move forward and they are considered a long-term project, the baseline year for HOV lanes should really be considered at a more realistic year to when they're actually implemented, which was 2035. So the issue is not the concept of that, but the fact that we had one piece of information in the draft and then it switched on, on us and was changed to a different year for the final. And the fact that the public did not have the opportunity to comment on that baseline year. And so basically we take what was in the final document, put it out to the public, solicit input, get comments on that, and then we're done. I mean, that resolves the issue really. Um, did that answer your question? Okay. Okay, I see Commissioners uh, Quinn and, and then uh, Commissioner Parker, you'll be up next, but I'll call in Commissioner Quinn. Well, thank you. Uh, two quick comments. Number one, I, I want to endorse what Mr. Preston said about responding to court. I think that's important. And number two, I want to uh, just comment on Mr. Schifrin's comment about projects he likes or doesn't like. You know, I, I assume my appointment is to advocate on behalf of the regional, including Aptos, and as someone who's uh, biked carpooled and driven from Aptos to Dominican Hospital for 25 years, it is untenable. And uh, there's a lot of rhetoric about the highway good or bad, train or good or bad. Uh, I would urge us to avoid the rhetoric and the opinions and look at the data and the cost of the people from Watsonville and Aptos who spend hours on Highway 1 because there's no other way to go. And should a train come, it's still years away. So I believe as a commission, we are failing the constituents, at least in Aptos, who are sitting on that highway, burning gas day after day. Hey, uh, Commissioner Parker. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, Guy Preston and uh, everything he says. Uh, I, I was looking very seriously, not only at this one, but our previous item um, about what the staff has talking about, and, and it's really about the focus of moving forward, addressing these issues as quickly as possible to keep the conversation going. It's not whether there's going to be an, a magical HOV, uh, you know, lanes happening uh, tomorrow, next week, but Caltrans um, uh, wants us to move forward in the sense that they want 
communication out to the public. I appreciate the explanation and the clarification in regards to the 2035 um, new deadline or new um, opening deadline. So I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I'm not in favor of putting it off and, and changing its categorization possibly based on what I heard. Uh, I'm just in favor of moving it forward and uh, finding out facts as we go and, and, and finding out from the people of today uh, what they think about uh, this information. And especially from South County, I think uh, 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 Dr. Quinn mentioned exactly um, what's going on. And after my entire life of going back and forth between Watsonville and Santa Cruz on the freeway, whether it's going to happen uh, immediately or not, and whether light rail will happen ever here or 50 years from now or 20 years from now, 10 years from now, uh, we need to explore all the options um, and uh, getting uh, our clean metro buses over there, whether it may be an auxiliary or uh, HOV. Uh, I think it's really important for us to understand we need to keep moving forward, which is why we had a unanimous vote on our last item. So I'd like to move forward with that on this one. And I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Commissioner Hernandez next. Uh, yeah, I wanted some clarification. Um, you know, I mean, I I think that uh, you know, honestly, with the HOV lanes, I mean, I'm not sure which direction the Cal Caltrans or you know Federal Highway is going. But I mean, I would like to know, um, find out from our director or maybe our Caltrans rep uh, that's here, you know, what they think future funding for HOV is, but. Also, I wanted clarification on some of the comments that Commissioner Rockin made about we need to make this decision for our auxiliary lanes because I, you know, I think that that was pretty uh, loud and clear here in South County um, for the for that decision um, that from the court court order uh, for us to do the EIR for the HOV uh, to move forward. Uh, so those two things I, I wanted to ask about. So thank you, uh, Commissioner Hernandez. Um, there are more challenges today than there have been in the past in funding HOV lanes. Um, the um, wholesale widening of freeways those days are um, not uh, not what we're experiencing today. Those projects are having a harder time finding funding sources. Um, uh, I, I do think that the court um, provided us a ruling um, that discussed both the uh, tier one and the tier two project. And it was one ruling. And I, I think it's a little bit dangerous picking and choosing parts of the ruling that we like and parts of the ruling that we don't like. Um, and I think it's important for us to move forward um, and respect the court's decision because it allows us to move forward with the auxiliary lanes that's, that was supported by the voters and supported by this commission. Uh, if we, you know, um, you know, move forward and recertify the document for HOV lanes, um, we're gonna be providing the public with additional information that'll be valuable for future decision makings, but it would not be approving a project level document at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any additional questions from commissioners? Or we take it out to the public. Okay, uh, so I will now call on uh, members of the public who would like to comment on this item. And we'll begin with uh, members who are present in the chambers. And um, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Longinati. I'm the chair of the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation and chair of the Sierra Club Transportation Committee. And uh, I thought I was going to have three minutes, so ask me any questions about our intentions for appealing this after I'm done, because I don't know that I'm going to get through all of, of, of. There was a slide presentation. I'll let staff pull that up. Uh, in the meantime, I want to say that we are in agreement with the staff's uh, understanding of the court decision that the auxiliary lanes can move forward. We're not happy about that part of the decision, but that's what the judge said. Uh, our appeal, if we decide to take it and we haven't decided to take it, would be partly on, on based on that. If you have a tier one project, 
uh, tier one EIR that's invalid, how can you go forward with a tier two project that's based on the tier one? We think the judge got it wrong, but we're not sure if we want to appeal yet. Partly it depends on what you do today. Um, we, uh, we have the slides up yet. Yeah. They're they're coming, and I will say, uh, Mr. Longinati, uh, given that, and we had spoken previously, and I had intended to give three minutes for public comment today. So if you go over, well, I'll just okay try to um, if you can so try to there's there's one it. part of the staff uh, interpretation decision we did not ag agree with. Maybe you read about it in the in the judge's uh, decision, but there are fundamental flaws regarding the project description and the baseline. And this requires the recirculation of the entire EIR. And I believe Caltrans has agreed with that point. So I think the staff uh, report is inadequate on that. But what that means is that the $250,000 is very likely an underestimate of what it would cost to do this next round of work. Uh, you might want to figure four times that amount. And I would appreciate a question from one of the commissioners to how much we've already spent on this EIR. Uh, and we don't want to fall into the trap of the, you know, the sunk cost fallacy that because I know it was 13 million on the draft EIR. I don't know what it was for the final, but since we already spent so much money, that means we need to spend more money. That's in, in vernacular, that's throwing good money after bad. We have the slides yet? Not yet. Yep. Oh, we do. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask if you can advance. So, so you can go back one slide, please. Okay, so the, this is a, a, a photo for, or a depiction, artist depiction of the HOV dream. Uh, that looks really enticing. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, but the, next slide. The reality is that the full funding won't be implemented until after 2035. You wanted data, there it is, uh, after 2035. And you know your people that know what that really means, which is maybe never. Next slide, please. Uh, the operational reality of expanding highways, we know that there's a consensus in scientific opinion. We, did, we you know, there's not a dispute about this, that adding capacity to roadways fails to alleviate congestion for long because it actually increases vehicle miles traveled. This is Susan Handy, who came to Santa Cruz a few years ago. Next slide. So if the draft EIR is recirculated, uh, another of the things that I have to do is to comply with new secret regulations, which require analyzing vehicle miles traveled. Next slide, including induced travel. Okay, so Caltrans is now saying induced travel is for real. Back when they did the draft EIR or the EIR that we're talking about today, they were not considering several aspects of induced travel. They're going to have to go back and do that. Next slide. Uh, they will be re required to mitigate increases in vehicle miles traveled. The, the EIR says that in, uh, the increase in vehicle miles traveled of the HOV project would be 29%. It'll be much more than that once Caltrans uses their new metrics, uh, counting induced travel. So we have to mitigate. How do we mitigate that? I think that's a question you really want to answer, don't you? Unless if you're going to spend money on a new project, like how are we even going to do this? Uh, next question. Um, so. Yes, that's my conclusion. The idea that the EIR can be easily fixed is mistaken. So we're talking a lot more than 250,000 here. Next slide. Um, does the community want the HOV project? Mr. Rockin already replied. Uh, next slide. We had the vote in Measure J. It was uh, needed a two thirds vote. It got 43%. Next slide. Um, so this is the, uh, what I hope the commission will adopt as your policy, time to tell the voters truth about congestion is use travel means we can't reduce congestion beyond the short term. We can't do it with, with new lanes. We can't do it with new bus lines. We can't do it with transit on the corridor. We can't do it with bus on shoulder. Not to say that those projects are not good projects because they give people alternatives, but they're not going to reduce congestion on the highway. It's physics, right? Next slide. Um, George Chandera was at this meeting with Susan Handy. He asked the most important question there. He said, so what can we do for South County commuters who are stuck in traffic? Next slide. Susan said, give them alternatives. So we're not going to tell them they're, they're going to have congestion relief. We give them alternatives. Next slide. I think the uh, RTC staff understand that. I've had conversations with them. And that's why they talk about moving people and not cars. Um, so whether we appeal, uh, 
uh, what can I say about that? I'd love to, I, I can't say, I can't speak for the Sierra Club or the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I can speak for myself. I'd love to see something happen today. Uh, and if nothing happens today, then what choices do we have? It's next slide. Mr. Longini, I'm just going to ask you to wrap it up because yes. we are. So thanks. I think I'm done. All right. Any questions? I'll be here. All right. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker. Hi, thank you again, Lonnie Faulkner, um, Equity Transit, uh, and thank you for your time. I just want to back up Rick Longinati, who provided the wonderful data, looking forward to um, no sooner than 2035, do we really want to spend funds, these STGB funds that could be used for other more pressing pertinent projects, whether they be supporting bus metro, the rail projects that we're looking at, and whatever other projects that are really pressing currently. Um, so I would like to recommend that the commissioners decline item number 25 today and um, think about better uses for those funds. Thank you. Hi, my name is Micah Posner. I've been fighting highway widening as an activist for about 20 years. Um, because I think it's unethical and unreasonable to widen highways in the face of global warming, and I don't think it works to help anyone. I was convinced early on by Tony Campos, actually, that if I don't want to widen the highway, that I need to support a train and other alternatives for people from South County. So I've also been doing that for 20 years because it does matter. We do need to support the people in South County, but not with something that ruins the world's climate and it doesn't really help for more than a few years. Um, so I'm here to ask you to please just stop with DHOV lanes. We've wasted like $13 million. It's never going to pass. Like you need local money. You already, we already voted not to give it to the commission and the state money as your executive director so honestly said, it's getting harder and harder and harder to get. So we're, you're, you know that you're never going to widen, the, you're never going to put in the HOV lanes. I mean, whether you want to or not, you disagree with me, you know that. I mean, I would imagine if I was sitting up there, that I would want to spend the $250,000 just because you might be pissed. It was like, you're getting sued and blah, blah, and you have this project, you want, you know, but I'm asking you to have some humility and just admit that like, you know, it's not going to happen and not spend money that you could spend on things that can happen that you do have consensus for in the community that can really make a difference. I know it's easy for me to ask you to have humility when I, you know, whatever, I'm just fighting the highway for 20 years. So I thought as a symbol, I would just kneel down and say, please, please just stop it. Just, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say like, I'm going to say like, please stop this, this crazy battle that's been going on for decades. Just, just stop. You know, we don't have to agree, but it ain't happening anyways. And this is money that can be used for things we can agree on. Please stop it. Okay, thank you. I do not see any other members of the public in the chambers who which wish to speak. So I'm going to take it out to callers. And our first caller is Brian from Trail Now. Hey, this is Brian from Trail Now. We absolutely support um, staff recommendation. We need to widen the highway um, to keep big, heavy traffic on that highway corridor so they're not driving through our neighborhoods, which they're doing now. Actually, because of the delay, more carbon dioxide has been impacting the environment with all of the delays. Um, it's interesting that they're saying we'll never get it until 2035, while at the same time you're going off and doing a major train study and investment that you won't get till 2045. And studies have shown that will have zero impact on traffic. Um, the way you manage traffic is you understand that it's a surge that comes through Highway 1, right? You have to have the capacity to do that. And then you apply policies like, you know, toll roads and HOV and, um, and carpooling and bus pooling. And you allow Metro to run buses on that. We absolutely need the corridor opened. Now, when I hear the train advocates complain that we need a solution, well, the solution's right in front of our eyes. It's the Santa Cruz Coastal Corridor. And we continue to delay the opening of it. That corridor needs to be open. 
And that's really an alternative that we need done as soon as possible. Looks like the clock is del- keep slowing down. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like you're giving me more time, but I won't take up more time. There you go. Anyway, so we support it um, moving forward and we support HOV lanes. Um, and we mostly uh, support opening the Santa Cruz Coastal Corridor as a transportation resource for active transportation. Let's stop delaying this 2035 that the train advocates are complaining about. Well, you're just imposing that on us now on the coastal corridor. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Saint. Uh, Can you hear me, Chair Brown? Yes. Okay, um, I do have a slide presentation also, but your timing thing is right in the middle of my slides. Um, So I'm not sure how we can fix that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Go ahead and watch the timer. Okay. Uh, It is worthwhile to consider the information uh, in making the decision that you have before you today. Uh, Next slide, please. Bus, the definition of bus on shoulder is a dedicated bus lane, as you can see here. Next slide, please. The current plan is not a true bus on shoulder. The bus only segments are only under the overpass. Next slide, please. The buses will operate in ox lanes with other traffic. Next slide. Congestion benefit of ox early lanes are none. Congestion, the Ox Lane alternative would slightly worsen traffic operations in southbound peak commute hours. Next slide, please. There is no safety benefit. The total accident rates overall would be the same as the accident rates for the no build alternative. Next slide. Here are the results from a poll the RTC commissioned in 2016. The weak support for the ox lanes would be even weaker um, if the question contained accurate information. The EIR stated there would not be enough congestion relief to attract vehicles that had diverted to the local street system back to the freeway. Next slide, please. Imagine express buses in dedicated lanes. Next slide, please. The 91 express bus makes good times after the morning commute. During commute times, a dedicated bus on shoulder will be better than what actually automobiles will be able to do. Next slide. Mr. St. Your time is up, so I just want to ask you if you could quickly finish up. This is the last slide, but you threw the timer in the middle of it (laughs) again. I'll just just keep talking. One more slide. We've got your slides. There you go. There you go. The 91 Express bus uh, makes good times in the morning compute. And as we said, uh, during commute times, a dedicated bus on shoulder would be better. And this slide goes to my wife commuted to her job in Stanford on the Highway 17 bus express, but she had to drive to either Santa Cruz or Scotts Valley to catch this bus. It is very easy for me to imagine good ridership on a Highway 17 express directly from either Watsonville also Aptos or the Capitola Transit Center. Please help us today by voting no on agenda item 25 and bring us closer to a 21st century transportation system. The voters mandate was to get Santa Cruz moving, not necessarily widening the highway for more cars. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Our next speaker, uh, Jack Nelson, you're up. Sorry, I needed to unmute. Now here I am, Jack Nelson. So uh, Mr. Longinati raised an important question. Can Caltrans and the RTC only produce a focused uh, revised EIR and circulate that, that only addresses a few questions, or does it need to uh, recirculate the entire EIR? 
Um, I read of the court decision is it's not that clear, but nowhere in that decision can you search the PDF and find the word focused or focused EIR. Uh, so maybe your commission should at least wait until uh, the court and the litigants come up with the follow-up instructions that are maybe more explicit about this. I'd also like to underscore what Mr. Longinati said about uh, these funds that are proposed to be used could be, are being stolen from Metro, from paratransit, from potholes, from anything else that you could beneficially use these funds for. And you're, it's proposed you're gonna take these and waste them on an EIR for a project that would never be built. So can't we do better than that? Lastly, um, I do think it's time for a state change in the RTC's thinking and to finally and forever leave behind this combustion friendly morality in which it's okay to expand the greenhouse gas combustion, the greenhouse gas production machine in order to uh, vainly try to fix congestion when what it's really going to do is continue to burn down our planet. That's, you know, if you don't believe me, listen to the climate scientists all over the world who are telling us we're looking down the barrel of a very big crisis. So let, let's do this right. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Griffith. And you can go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself or use your unmute button. So. Yes, unmute. We hear you, Jackie. You can hear me. Okay, yes. thank you for the chance to, to speak on this. I, I support the things that Rick Longinati was saying. I, I do not think, I do not want you to go forward and commit this $225,000 to, under the, all the circumstances that people have brought up that are faulty on this, that it may take four times as much to do it. If it's so, we should you know wait until we can clarify that. I, just before this, you passed this thing to find out about rail, about the rail trail, and if it, what we can do there. So that's an excellent reason to wait because you don't know what your situation is, either from what the EIR is or from what um, other opp opportunities we can hope for. Everything says that, that widening the highway, anything you do to the highway doesn't really get people off the other streets and it doesn't help the traffic. In fact, it increases it. And good grief, you know, we're so lucky here where it isn't so hot. Most of the country is in drought, terrible drought, and terrible heat. And this is only going to increase or things like Kentucky, where everybody's underwater. <laughs> I just don't see that this is the direction that funding is going to go in the future. I think that work patterns may change in order to, to reduce traffic on the highway. There may be things that we can do, but building out a freeway with extra lanes. Now the bus only lane, that makes a lot of sense. And that would really help uh, for Watsonville people coming and going to work. It may be it's only during certain hours, I don't know. Okay, that's my time. Thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. Uh, next up is Adam Miller Ball. Welcome. <laughs> And thank you, Chair Brown. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. My name's Adam Millard Ball. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm also a professor of urban planning and I teach about transportation and climate change. And I'd, I'd like to make um, two major points. Um, first of all, we just can't build ourselves out of congestion. And traffic in the region is already going in the wrong direction. Um, I just saw an analysis from the State Air Resources Board, which showed that vehicle travel has increased 13% in the region per capita um, over the 10 years to 2019. 
So even before we start building new highways, that's already going in the wrong direction. Um, building more highways is going to only add fuel to that. And Highway 1 would be just as congested as before because of induced travel. Um, we'd have exactly the same congestion in the long run, but with more climate pollution. This project isn't consistent with the counties and the region's environmental plans. And then the second key point, as many speakers have, um, have raised, there's no funding on the horizon to actually build this project anyway. So since highway expansion, even Caltrans admits that highway expansion is coming to an end, um, since it's an environmental and a fiscal non-starter, why should we throw good money after bad? Why plan for a project? Why do more analysis in a project that isn't going to happen? Um, so it's time to take a break, if not to pull the plug on this project altogether. And I realize that technically this item isn't a decision on highway expansion itself, but if you aren't committed to highway expansion, why spend this money? And so I urge commissioners to reject the staff recommendation and to not do or to shelve any further analysis on the AR, or at the least to follow Commissioner Schifrin's suggestion to use highway funds for the analysis rather than the STVG. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Ron Swenson. And I believe uh, Mr. Swenson is here in person um, and on the line. So um, come on up. Good to see you. You only get to talk once, though. <laughs> I, I think my uh, phone will stay muted here. Thank you very much for the opportunity here to speak. I was had the great good fortune in 1966 as I was a young uh, teacher at San Jose State instructor, I heard Bucky Fuller visit the class I was teaching for two months. And after two months, I kind of got it because he said it over and over again, we must save our oil for a rainy day. You have heard that the United States is doing better than ever in being the largest producer of oil. But let me tell you, we're scraping the bottle of bottom of the barrel. We're talking about this as a celebration. It is not. I just read the other day that James Lovelock, the head of the guy that invented the Gaia hypothesis, said, "My main reason for not relaxing into a contented retirement." is that like most of you, I'm deeply concerned about the probability of massively harmful climate change and the need to do something about it now. Mr. Koenig's, Commissioner Koenig, you mentioned getting off of fossil fuels. We can't just do it with electric cars. That's not gonna solve the problem. I hear very clearly those of you who are traveling from Watsonville or places between here and there where you hit this congestion. Clearly, we have to rethink this problem. I am not an advocate. I'm a builder. My grandfather built a Palomar Hotel, and you all know how many other buildings we've put here in many years. I can help you build. I can be a contractor and help you build a system that will work. You just have to give me a call when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swenson. No wasting money. Uh, I, I will next, uh, this is all right, for folks who are out there in the audience, if you do wanna speak on this item, uh, please get your hand up. Uh, otherwise this will be our last speaker, uh, Barry Scott, welcome. Thank you, this is Barry Scott at Aptos, uh, in Aptos and I wanna thank, first of all, Guy, uh, Director Preston for, for pointing out that uh, highway widening projects are harder and harder to fund. Indeed, it's it's Caltrans itself has, has expressed uh, the, the concern with uh, induced demand. It's not just Susan Handy at UC Davis anymore. And uh, I think as you all know, the governor's office and planning is, and Caltrans is leaning more toward anything that reduces vehicle miles travel. I, I have in front of me a, a page from the 2015 EIR for the tier one project. It shows, and, and you know, these tier two projects are all incremental toward this gigantic eight lane highway. I'm not kidding you. I'm looking at the Rio Del Mar overpass 
after the tier one is completed, and I know this this project is is just a part of the overall larger project, but eight lanes is, is just never going to happen. Um, I wonder, and I remember that a motion was made at a, a meeting some months ago to move funds from Metro to road repairs. I, uh, Commissioner uh, Koenig made the motion and it passed, move up one or $2 million. And so I wonder as we as we move ahead, if we might not consider uh, more of this, this kind of uh, moving funds. I know that Measure D uh, had it of 2016 had its allocations and only 8%, even though it started off higher than 8%, it started off, I'm told 20% and then was 15 and 14, dropped down to 8% per rail, that's unfortunate. But I hope we will uh, keep in mind the potential for shifting funds from one bucket to another, as long as we're getting to something that will really provide relief and less dependency on uh, automobiles. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Casey Beyer. Thank you, Chairman Brown and commissioners. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, in 2004, there was an initiative that went to the ballot in, in Santa Cruz County that uh, was opposed by the people that are suing uh, you and Caltrans uh, have filed the legal suit. Uh, they were then called the uh, Committee for Sensible Transportation at that time. Um, and they opposed uh, HOV lanes, which was included in that ballot measure. It failed miserably. We fast forward to 2016, we learned a couple of lessons. One, HOV lanes were not going to be part of the future of that rail, of that corridor, even though people want it. So, so Measure D in 2016 did not include uh, HOV lanes. It did include the um, the, the uh, auxiliary lanes, whether they're uh, uh, the right end, end result for moving transportation or not, but that's what was in the measure. Uh, I'm just making this point that this is both a legal challenge for the RTC and Guy, I think you got it right. Mr. President, I think you got it right. You kind of got your your hands tied behind your back and you're trying to make, move forward with uh, transportation improvements throughout the county in the different buckets. And then secondly, uh, this is a, a political conversation uh, and I hate to get political, but if you go through with the HOV lane uh, plan and do the EIR, and it, it, it has some type of similability that it could be potentially possible, I guarantee you there will be an initiative on the ballot to kill it. So just bear in mind that, that you're in a rock and a hard spot, and I recommend that the staff move forward with its, uh, its proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I um, do not see any additional hands up virtually, and I think we are, we've are we completed our public comment from speakers in the room, and so I will bring it back to the commission for uh, deliberation and action. And um, I'm looking for um, comments and or uh, a motion. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. A motion that we accept staff's recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, by, that was Commissioner McPherson. Thank you. Was the second. Um, Commissioner Hernandez, I see your hand up. Yeah, you know, um, I, you know, I don't personally. I don't think that uh, HOV lanes or highway widening are something that is going to be funded or, you know, now or in the near future, and especially in 2035. And, you know, the I think what the last speaker was referring to, I think, you know, really hit hits the nail, hammer on the nail about, you know, it's really confusing that we have to do this level of an EIR for this project um, when it's something that, you know, we're not really uh, tied to. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, what I wanted to ask staff is, can we use uh, whatever criteria or standards that we used for the EIR that we used from SoCal to the fish hook? Can we use that level of standards or criteria, even though it might be less than, but still use it for the EIR that we're doing um, just to be on the safe side? 
even though it might be to a lesser standard of an EIR, but also just to incorporate it, um, just to fulfill the court ruling and to fulfill any future endeavors that we have. Um, you know, I think any projects that we have have to be feasible uh, financially. And I think also we have to make sure we do more sustainable options too. So that was my question um, about putting different lesser standards on, on the EIR that will fulfill lesser projects. <laughs> um, so I thank you, Com Commissioner Hernandez. I think Sarah, uh, Ms. Christensen, you're here to respond. Did you get that question? Yeah, um, I'm not aware of an approach that would use like a lesser standard. Um, the way that this court ruling is being interpreted interpreted by Caltrans is um, that it is a very focused circulation. So it's not opening up the entire document and having to redo an extensive amount of work. It's um, It's not even really performing any additional analysis. It's going through the process to allow public comment on information that's readily available, um, responding to those comments and then recertifying. So I suppose I, um, I'm not aware of any lesser standard that we can do that to, but um, you know. Well, I'm referring to whatever was used from like tier two or from the, you know, the project for the auxiliary lanes from SoCal to the fish hook, you know, for that EIR, for example. I don't understand. Uh, so, so, um, so uh, Commissioner Hernandez, um, I'm hearing uh, Ms. Christensen isn't clear about the question. The question, um, are you? You're talking about the for the EIR, um, the portion that is ox lanes rather than HOV. Correct. Okay. So, does that help clarify? So, um, just to remind. Um, Commissioner Hernandez, the, the the court order is really focused on the tier one. And so um, there's not a lot of content um, that we could pull from from other parts of, of this document or any other document for that matter, because it is somewhat of a unique um, analysis being programmatic. So um, I'm not aware of anything we can kind of cut and paste and <laughs> so, so what I think I'm hearing is not, not necessarily cut and paste, but I mean, so if we do this document and then not go forward with HOV lanes, we basically waste 250. I mean, is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> uh, I mean, it'd be good if we could use it for future endeavors or future projects. I think, sure. I think Commissioner Hernandez, um, providing the public with the information that the court ordered us to do is is important, and I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as as wasted money. Um, I actually really appreciate your you thinking outside the box. Um, we've done a lot of that too, but um, unfortunately, if we were to move forward with a separate project we'd be looking at a se separate document and that is the tier two document. So um, we we do still recommend that we move forward, you know, following what the court asked us to do and provide the recirculation of the, the document that he asked us to recirculate. Um, if we start to try to do something different, I fear that um, we may get ourselves in, into trouble and, and that could affect our ability to move forward with the rest of the program. Is in front okay, of me. so I, I uh, Ari's in front of me, but I'd like to speak. Yeah, got gotcha. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up, uh, Commissioner Parker. Thank you. I, I, I'm I'm going to support this because it moves things forward, and it is about the public getting uh, from the courts a direction. The public uh, needs to have this accessible again to make comments to be understood uh, because of whatever they found. All I see this is is moving this forward. The staff says we should do it. It will create less complications in all areas as we move forward. Then we need to do this. And all this rhetoric about you know wasteful or you know it's let's just move forward. Staff knows what they're doing on this, uh, just like they did on twenty four. They're moving projects forward with opportunities. They're complying with what the courts asked. So you know. 
let's just move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to call on Commissioner Schiffer next. And I just wanted to say um, I'm getting used to trying to track the screen versus hands raised. And so if I do miss you or I forget, just remind me as Commissioner Schiffer just did. So um, go ahead, you're next, and then I'll come back around. Thank you. A um, couple of things. The staff report is in two recommendations, or the staff recommendation is in two parts. The first part is to authorize um, moving forward with the recirculation of the EIR um, and the sec uh, for the HOV lane. And the second part is to take the money to do that out of uh, surface transportation block grant funds. There's an irony that strikes me in our discussion of this, and that is um, thinking about uh, people who are HOV skeptics that we're hearing today and people who are rail skeptics. And a lot of the discussion is very similar to my to my thinking. There are people who think we will never be able to do rail. It's just not going to be feasible. It's not going to be fundable. And there are people who believe we're never going to be able to do uh, the HOV project. Caltrans doesn't want to do it. There'll never be the money. Um, I in listening to what we've mostly heard about over time, the real skeptics is sort of like, I don't feel very comfortable about projecting the future. There's a constituency that feels strongly that rail is potentially feasible and we need to pursue it. Um, there's a constituency that feels we really need to wire the, widen the highway and we need to move forward to do that. When we... Uh, when Measure D was put together in 2016, and it was a compromise. It was a compromise about those people who really cared about widening the highway and those people who really cared about Metro, who really cared about the rail trail, who really cared about um, the, the uh, uh, rail itself. And it passed because there was that willingness by everyone to compromise. And I think part of that compromise for me meant uh, going along with those uh, people who uh, really felt strongly that it was necessary to pursue, pr pursue highway, uh, highway widening and it was important to do it and we should do what we could to make it happen. Whether it's gonna happen or not, um, there are skeptics and those skeptics might turn out to be my, right. And I probably am one of them, but um, there are also well-meaning and reasonable skeptics about rail. And I'm not one of those. So my sense is we should move forward with this. I'm, I am willing to support and, and I, I think it's important to support the uh, moving forward with the uh, with a project that the commission has been pursuing for decades and which has the commission has been pursuing at a very high cost just in terms of the environmental document. So I, I support the first staff recommendation, but just like the, um, the recommendation on, on item number 24, which was to move forward with uh, uh, rail planning, the cost of that is going to come out of the Measure D rail funds. And I think that's appropriate. I don't think anybody raised the concern that, oh, well, we should figure out how we could take it out of some other source that doesn't reduce our very limited um, money for uh, rail. As we know, it is limited. And uh, one of the concerns that staff raised was by moving forward with uh, the rail plan, some of the preservation uh, work is not going to be able to happen or it's going to get the, it's going to get delayed. Well, I think that um, it, despite the fact that I wish we could, the, there was other, there was another source of funds and maybe the S, uh, S TBG funds could have been could be used for um, the rail plan. It didn't come up, and staff didn't recommend it. Um, and I don't know whether it's possible or not. I do think that it's legitimate when we're talking about a project that is uh, to uh, related to widening the highway to ask that 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 fund the funding for that come out of Measure D. Now. 
it seems to me that if the um, commission agrees to uh, a majority of the commission agrees to move forward with recommendation number one, that's going to be sending the message to the court and to the community that the um, the court's ruling is going to be responded to, that the EIR is going to be recirculated and hopefully will meet the court's standard. Um, so I, I think approving recommendation one is possible. Um, is uh, sends the message that needs that staff is saying needs to be sent, or sh at least should be sent. I don't think that's necessary. That approving uh, recommendation number two um, for where the funds come from undermines that just because it means putting off for a few months um, the um, amendment of the expenditure plan that would allow for using these funds. Uh, using the Measure D funds for paying for this. So, again, I'm prepared to support the uh, recommendation one. I think uh, the commission should support it, um, but I would like to make a motion to amend the motion on the floor to uh, revise recommendation number two to uh, to provide a direction to staff to return to the commission with funding for the um, uh, recirculation of the EIR to come from Measure D highway funds. Second. That's we, Mike Rodkin second. We, yes. we have a, a motion to amend uh, I, uh, part two of the main motion, which is the staff recommendation and a second uh, by Commissioner Rotkin. And, um, and I still have a comment, by the way. Okay, so I, I know that we're, we're coming back around here. I just want <laughs> because we do now have um, another item, and I see that um, uh, Ms. Christensen is at the podium. That means you want to respond to this? No, it's, it's just that there's a process for that. So it might not be immediate or, or it might not just be a one month kind of hold. There's a process to amend. The expenditure plan that could take now you know if we don't move forward on this item today it would be coming back to you the next rtc meeting being september 1st and then there's the 45 day process after that so okay. just keep that in mind that that would be 30 days plus 45 days okay approximately so, thank you for clarifying that Okay, so I'll come back around now, um, Commissioner Rotkin, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. So the, the first comment is that um, because of the court ruling, taking longer does not delay in any way the construction work and environmental and construction work on the auxiliary lane projects. It would be a different argument if like, you know, while we're messing around with this, you know, court question and stuff, we have to, it ties up our going ongoing projects. No, the court was very explicit in the decision that we can go ahead with those projects. So I'm not clear what the cost of a delay is, if, as Andy pointed out, Andy Schiffman pointed out that, you know, we could, we might take a little longer to make it happen, but we're going to comply with it. My bigger question is I'd like to get some kind of response to Rick Longinati's one of only one of his points um, that the new well, first of all, part of the first part of the question is if we recirculate, the public have a right to comment on the recirculation, I assume, and therefore they will Rick will make those comments in response, and his argument, and I don't I don't know if it's a valid one, uh, is cal is. Are we going to be, is our sequel requirements going to be such that we're going to have to explain what the mitigation is for adding more vehicle miles and the greenhouse gas production that that leads to? Is that, do we have, will we have to do that? In which case, $250,000 is not going to do it. That's a huge mitigation. I can't even imagine that there is one, but maybe there is. I don't know. So trying to understand, sure. in other words, even if we do minimal work, it doesn't take that much to sort of recirculate it. Be clear, put out the information, this is what's correct and so forth. But don't don't the public get to then respond and don't we have to do something else about that? Or or do they have to would they then sue us if we don't do something else? I'm not sure what the process is there. So the process um, that I understand, because we've, you know, Caltrain staff 
you know, this is a very unique one. This is not, we can't just take some kind of template off the shelf and go through a process that um, is already done because this is out of the box. Programmatic documents are not commonly prepared for Caltrans projects. We're pretty unique, yeah. Santa Cruz. Um, <laughs> but when we recirculate the EIR, my understanding of how this will work is um, that we recirculate the document, but we only solicit comments on the very focused areas that the court is directing us to recirculate on. So those three very focused areas being the baseline year, the project description, and um, the MSAT, the air quality um, health effects. And so members of the community may choose to make comments on the whole document, but um, the court is only ordering us to respond, you know, take comments and circulate on those very focused items. But, but if the response to the, if, if the response to one of those recirculated items is the question of the new standard about like what the induced, uh, right. so increased vehicle miles um, traveled, isn't that? It, I, I don't know that it's automatic, but wouldn't that give it a pretty big opening for uh, any of the public or a member of the public or group to say, well, they haven't said how they're going to mitigate this new thing that this information now reveals clearly in a way that it wasn't revealed clearly in the first circulation? Sure. Um, I can respond to that. So the um, the petitioner did um, make claims about the vehicle miles traveled um, for the project and the greenhouse gas emission uh, analysis, and the court um, rejected all of that. Thank you. That's very helpful. So, um, and also just to continue the discussion about VMT, it is very important for this community, this commission to reduce vehicle miles traveled, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and our program. Um, this commission should really be proud of our program of projects. We are extremely multimodal and we are at the forefront of um, on a statewide level of delivering projects that are multimodal, that address um, the governor's executive orders for um, adapting to climate change and combating climate change. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a moving target though. So, you know, there's been a new CEQA requirement you know, past, you know, when our project was going through the analysis, since then there's a VMT requirement now for projects. Our projects have been studying VMT since before, long before it was required. Um, and that's just because of the fabric of this county. We're very um, environmentally conscious and multimodal. And so um, there is actually a VMT analysis. We weren't even required to do it. It was in the document the court throughout the claims about it. So could I try to help Monica. with the uh, EIR question? Because I teach a class on CEQA and uh, this issue of what will be recirculated is been uh, there are lots of examples. Um, if Caltrans would recirculate the entire EIR, then the public could comment on everything. Um, if Caltrans only circulated that those portions of the EIR that the judge found inadequate, the public can only comment on those portions. Um, when the university adopted its EIR, uh, or they had a draft EIR for an earlier LRDP, they decided because they hadn't analyzed the potential effects on Highway 1, that they would only recirculate that section on Highway 1. That was all the public could comment on. It didn't reopen the whole EIR. So I think there's been some confusion in how it's been presented. Um, should the whole EIR be recirculated? Um, and I don't remember the court's opinion that clearly um, Mr. Longinati seemed to imply that they required that the entire EIR be recirculated. I read it carefully. If that's not the case, and only those sections that the judge found uh, uh, inadequate were 
need to be corrected, then it's totally appropriate for the lead agency and the and the commission paying for what is done to just recirculate those sections and the public can only comment on those sections and the judge will then if that if that's then challenged um determine whether the uh the eir has adequately responded to the concerns that the judge raised so i hope that helps in terms of what gets commented on and what doesn't get commented on it does and staff is continuing to work with caltrans on this and it's um we don't have all the details figured out obviously um we need the technical support <laughs> in order to kind of get into um the details and um figure out a really solid approach and so that's why we're making the recommendation today to do that well let me just say that to the extent it is legally possible to just circulate uh, just recirculate those sections that were uh, the judge didn't approve, it will save a lot of money, time, and grief uh, to just recirculate those sections. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, uh, Director Preston, did you, I, I thought you, maybe you were going to make a comment. I yeah, I was just going to elaborate a little bit on what, what Sarah was saying with regards to, to analysis of vehicle miles traveled. Um, Senate Bill 741 is the legislation that the state passed that changed the way we analyze traffic impacts. Um, and instead of looking at level of service, which was the old method um, of continuing to try to um, build our way out of traffic, we now we now look at vehicle miles traveled. But the 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 legislation didn't require that every project comply with SB 741 from the day that it was implemented. Um, it had a, a, a kind of rolling out of when projects would have to comply. And it was based on when the environmental document started. And this project started well before that legislation was passed. The court did not rule uh, in the favor of the plaintiffs with respect to BMT analysis. We're not being asked to go back and do that part of the project. Um, and we don't in intend to. Um, Sarah is correct that we did um, go over and beyond what the requirements were for this project and doing a VMT analysis. And we did provide that for public comment. Okay, um, so I, I'm gonna come back around here. I uh, believe Commissioner Bertrand, you're up next. Before, before you? I, sure. I thought so, but no, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, I'm trying to track. Uh, Commissioner McPherson, you're up. Yeah, a lot of things have been said that uh, I wanted to have clarified. I guess they have on this complex subject, but a uh, long and short of it is I think that uh, we should follow the initial the initial motion that I seconded uh, in supporting what the court directed and what the staff has re recommended. End of story. <laughs> Okay, um, so we are uh, we we have an amendment that we're going to uh, just to clarify what we're doing next. Um, we do have an amendment to the main motion, which we will vote on now, um, and that is to um, related to to the the funding source for this recirculation. Um, so I'm going to make a quick comment about that uh, before we take that vote, and then we'll proceed to uh, vote on the main motion. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, um, I recognize that, that there are potential challenges with um, and, and a lengthening of the time frame for recirculating um, if we were to uh, identify and, and utilize a different funding source. Um, but I, um, given that, I, you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic, I'm one of those who's a serious skeptic of uh, the um, you know, the feasibility, both financial um, and kind of practical feasibility of uh, highway widening uh, to say nothing of the um, climate uh, uh, change challenges that we face and that we absolutely have a responsibility to be addressing now and, um, and, and not kind of dancing around and pretending we're going to do something down the road um, that is, is not um, does not look feasible and is going to be really detrimental to um, our our climate with the uh, increased greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled as a result. So 
I I don't believe that we should be spending money that can be spent on other um, other projects that people want that can be delivered um, uh, sooner and that can can actually be delivered and that will help us achieve our uh, our climate goals. Um, so I, I support uh, trying to use a different source of funding. I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, because I, I recognize that we're the implementing agency and, and Caltrans is the lead agency. Um, and it's been sort of um, referenced that um, Caltrans, you know, or implied, I guess, that Caltrans wants us to do this. Um, I And I, so I guess I just wonder if um, we ought not to be asking Caltrans to fund this. Um, it's just, I'm going to put out there, <laughs> it's maybe perhaps a rhetorical question, but if there is any insight on the whether or not that's even something we could ask them, um, just throw it out there um, before we take a vote on uh, shifting to measure D rather than the um, RSTPX uh, exchange funds. So we did ask Caltrans um, whether they could fund this. Um, they don't have a funding source available to fund this. Um, it would have likely have been the STIP funds, but back um, when they redirected the STIP funds to the regions, uh, we became in control of, of that money and we've programmed our STIP funds already for something different. Um, so the only fund source we could come up with without amending the expenditure plan um, for Measure D is the STPG, RSTPX funds. Um, to, to amend the expenditure plan, we would have to notice, put a notice in the paper, let people know we're extending, planning on um, amending the expenditure plan to add HOB lanes, which may come across as being um, a little unusual. Um, we would have to then come back to the commission and then notify the, the local agencies. Thank you. Um, okay, and and I will. I do want to acknowledge that point, and uh, but also say that in from my perspective, um, if we're worried about what the voters might think about spending money uh, to uh, recirculate an EIR over HOV lanes, then um, I think we have a lot more to worry about down the road with the potential to actually ever fund this project. Um, so, um, but I, I do appreciate your. Um, you're thinking on that. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and um, I don't see any other uh, hands up. So we'll go ahead and call a vote um, on uh, the amendment to the main motion. And we'll do a roll call. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Bertrand. No. Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. No. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? No. Commissioner Kristen Brown? No. Commissioner Caput? Commissioner Hernandez. Hernandez. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Parker? No. Commissioner Alternate Hurst? No. Commissioner Johnson. No. Johnson. We have six no's. Okay, so that means that the, the motion fails. Um, and so we will um, now move on to consider the main motion. And I wanted to ask, um, because we got um, kind of talking about the amendment. So if does anybody have any comments you'd like to make before we take a vote on the main motion? Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, um, with some trepidation, I'm gonna support the main motion, um, but I would like to add uh, a request to the staff that when they return with the uh, contract for the rail project, uh, that was approved in item number 24, that they also include some discussion of possible other funding sources for that project um, that are under our local control. Because we've been acting as if um, only Measure D funds could be spent for uh, the rail project. Um, but here we're seeing that for the highway projects, it's not just measure D funds. It's also uh, things like STPG. And I don't know whether um, there might be some way of making that rail project and the STB, 
G project as well. So it could provide some of the uh, support for that. But I would like that to be part of the staff report when the contract returns. Um, uh, as I said, um, I think in good faith, based on the compromise that was reached with Measure D uh, in 2016, uh, I will uh, can, uh, I will support as I have supported and supervised. Uh, Commissioner uh, Coonerty has supported highway widening projects uh, over the last uh, six or seven years um, as part of the uh, compromise and recognizing that. Um, there's a real problem on Highway 1, and it's important to try to respond to it. So I will support the motion. Hey, I'll call next on Commissioner Hernandez. Um, I'll support the motion too, and uh, you know, I, I really um, want to echo uh, Commissioner Schifrin's comments as well. Um, you know, I Again, you know, I'm one of the non-believers of the HOV lanes. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to, I think, the auxiliary lanes, uh, I think we have to listen to some of the uh, voters and some of the uh, folks in South County as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional comments by members of the commission? Or he has her hand up. Oh, there we go. Hi, Commissioner Parker, you're up. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to follow up with um, Director uh, Schifrin's comment. Uh, the STG, excuse me, the STGB uh, funds or block grant funds. Um, if we're just going to find out uh, what they can be used for, maybe that's a better way to have that report brought back to us. What can they be used for? Uh, and then we have a more, we have a clearer understanding of whether it's metro, auxiliary lanes, rail you know, uh, uh, whatever it may be used for. And then um, Director Preston can give that clarity to uh, all of us. I think that would be great. Thank you. I um, I just wanna make a, a one more comment before we uh, move forward with the vote. Um, so I, um, and I, you know, all of there's all these thoughts running through my head of uh, things that I have heard uh, said today, and and um, you know, I'm in agreement with much of it. I and I'm, but I'm going to speak frankly now. Um, I have uh, made comments at this commission uh, over the years that I, I do not believe that highway widening is going to um, is going to address the problems uh, that uh, commuters, the, the very real problems that commuters face. And I um, I, I have a hard time um, sounding as if I may be unresponsive to those concerns because I, they're very real. And, you know, working families, people need to be able to get to and from work in a timely manner. People are suffering. I recognize that. Um, but And I have made comments that I don't believe that highway widening is going to address those uh, those challenges um, because of induced demand. I believe that uh, the modeling that's done, the projections, and I believe that a lot of the research that has come out suggests that um, induced demand is real and that this will not provide relief. So I've said that. I've talked about my uh, concerns about uh, continuing to uh, spend a lot of money um, on infrastructure uh, that is, is car centric. And I have also voted um, as part of that agreement, that compromise that um, was made around Measure D, I have voted to support my colleagues and what what I hear from uh, members of the public. Um, you know that they want to see uh, the highway widened, and um, but I can't do that today. Um, I can't do that because um, I think we're at a point now where you know we've we've made it clear that we're gonna move forward with the ox lanes, which I also didn't support, but I have agreed to um, to support because I know that's what my colleagues are asking for. Um, and I will just quickly say, um, I've, been, I've been saddened that um, many of my colleagues have not had the same spirit of compromise with respect to the rail and um, moving forward with uh, environmental review for rail planning. 
And um, so today I'm, I'm just, I, I think that we're, the, the challenges are too great. I mean, climate change is real. We are in, we are heading towards and, and already in um, a major um, catastrophic change that has to be addressed by reducing greenhouse gases. And this is the uh, single largest greenhouse gas emitting project of any that I've ever seen during my time in Santa Cruz and my time in office. Um, and I can't support recirculating an EIR and spending money that could be spent on other um, other matters that are, are much more immediate and 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 are possible you know possible to achieve more immediately um, right now um, and um, if it were to come from highway funds um, uh, perhaps I could have uh, taken a different view today um, but I'm not going to be able to support the main motion and um, with that um, um, I didn't mean to have the last word, but in my role as chair, that's kind of what happens sometimes. So I'll go ahead and call for the vote now. Commissioner Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner Sandy Brown? No. Commissioner Bertrand? I agree. Commissioner Rotkin? No. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Quinn? Yes. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Commissioner Alternate Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Parker? Yes. Commissioner Alternate Hurst? Aye. And Commissioner Johnson? Aye. That passes. Okay, so that, that vote uh, passes. Um, I will go ahead now and uh, we'll, we'll begin. Actually, I see a, a comment. Nope, never mind. Yes, yes. My hand up. Yes, <laughs> Commissioner uh, Hernandez, go ahead. You know, uh, Commissioner uh, Schiffrin's request, I don't know if we need to put that as a future request or something, but looking at different funding sources, whether it's the SPG or the the um, the uh, S, different, uh, the S, S, R, S, T, P, X, different sources that we can look at for rail as well. Director Preston, they already indicated that he was willing to do that, I think. Yeah, I, I think. Sorry, you're you're not in the room, so you don't see the heads nodding. <laughs> but we will; that will um, be forthcoming. Okay, uh, so we are now at the end of our meeting. Our next meeting will be a transportation policy workshop meeting. I'm scrolling to make sure I get the date right. I believe that will be Thursday, August seventeenth, and our next regular commission meeting will be uh, the first Thursday in September. Uh, thank you all for your participation and your support uh, with the logistics and getting this meeting uh, happening, this first hybrid meeting, and uh, we'll look forward to more. Uh, see you at the next meeting. Take care. Yeah, thanks. What is it again? <laughs> Uh, our, our next, so we have a transportation policy workshop, which will be via Zoom on August 17th. 18th. Wednesday, August 17th? It's the Thursday, 18th. August 18th. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to scroll and it's not happening. There we go. So um, we're having a, a policy workshop. In, in all likelihood, that that meeting will be canceled. Will be canceled. Okay. Um, it's, so, it's a placeholder at this. Point. So then it. it I, I thought it was only on here when it was for sure happening. Um. Okay. So that's. So our next meeting will be uh, September first. First Thursday. The first Thursday in September. Thank you.